what do you think about when you hear the words Kentucky Fried Chicken? Me? I think about being a little kid and about how Kentucky Fried Chicken was a special fast food treat. Fast food that felt like a good sit-down restaurant food to little me. There wasn't a fast food restaurant within 100 miles of where I spent most of my childhood. And back when I was in grade school and junior high for shopping trips, for things like uh, back-to-school shopping or for buying Christmas presents, my mom, sister Donna, and I, maybe my grandparents' mom, sister, and I, would drive two hours north of Riggins to Lewiston, Idaho, the big city, the big city of, at that time, still less than 30,000 people. Plenty enough people, though, especially with the uh, smaller sister city of Clarkston, Washington, cross the river and all the students from Lewis Clark State College for a bunch of fast food chains. There was McDonald's, the no longer there Skippers, A&W Root Beer, Taco Time, not Bell, Taco John's, still not Bell, Taco Bell. Subway, Arby's, uh, one of the stores with the old big ass cowboy hat signs, Domino's Pizza, Pizza Hut, Little Caesars, several others, I'm sure, and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Delicious. Oh man, we grab a big uh, family style bucket full of, I don't even remember how many pieces of fried chicken, original recipe style. And I was allowed one drumstick and one piece of breast meat. And then there were the biscuits. We each got one. Holy shit, little packets of butter or some chemical equivalent of butter, uh, packets of honey to drizzle all over them. Makes my mouth water uh, thinking about it right now. Uh, We'd also get a side of mashed potatoes and gravy. Instant mashed potatoes, I know, but good instant mashed potatoes made up of dehydrated potato flakes, powdered nonfat milk, a little bit of who knows what with a little container of that delightfully salty brown gravy. I always always made sure uh, we got mashed potatoes. And for a vegetable, well, who gives a shit? I think we got corn. Not that I cared about it. I just wanted the delicious chicken, soft, delectable biscuits, and mashed potatoes and gravy. And dessert. Little bucket parfaits, baby. Sadly, those little buckets discontinued in 2012. Damn you, Sara Lee. Damn you, mine calendar. Uh, Sara Lee produced these uh, parfaits until the two companies stopped doing business together uh, that year. The cups came in three flavor options, right? Some locations, most only offered two. Strawberry shortcake or chocolate? Caramel apple was the third wild card. I always got the chocolate. Little plastic cup with graham cracker crust crumbs on the bottom, then a big midsection of chocolate pudding, then whipped cream with a few chocolate sprinkles tossed on top and aluminum foil uh, to seal in all the freshness and flavor. I love those things so much. I could have eaten my weight in them. They were a perfect ending to what for a time was probably my favorite fast food meal. Definitely one of my favorites. Years later, I would eat some nostalgia when I'd share in some KFC with my kids, Kyler Monroe in Santa Monica. There was one near our apartment and sometimes I'd grab a bucket. We'd head to the beach or to the park and Kyler Monroe and I would have a little picnic and feast. And later, Lindsay maybe joined for like one or two times. She's not a big fast food fan. Her loss. Monroe, when she was about four years old, uh, went through this funny phase where she loved KFC. Always wanted the drumsticks and she would devour them like a feral wild animal. Like for this brief period of time, she would eat everything except the bone, all the breading, all the meat. She would eat all the gristle, just be gone. Just a polished little chicken bone would remain. I have a lot of good memories of KFC. And I have ultimately one man I never met to thank for them all. Brad Pitt, the man behind the chicken, the beautiful fried chicken maestro who not only came up with America's favorite fried chicken recipe, but also a man who transcends notions of sexuality. You can be straight, but still want to sleep with Brad Pitt. It doesn't make you homosexual. It just makes you a Brad Pitt sexual. And everyone is a Brad Pitt sexual. Uh, You can deny it all you want, but I won't believe you. And neither will Brad if he ever chooses to seduce you, which he will. If he chooses, it'll happen. And of course, Brad Pitt is not the man behind the KFC brand. Uh, He's not the Colonel. Harland David Sanders was the Colonel. Colonel Sanders. And I forgot if I ever actually knew how inspiring his story of creating KFC truly was until just recently. Did you know that his dad died when he was just five and his mom wouldn't remarry for seven years? And during that time, little Harlan would take various jobs to help provide for the family. And he was also put in charge of cooking for mom and his little brother and little sister. By the age of seven, he was said to be skilled with bread and vegetables, getting better with meat. And he'd go on to cook for others for the rest of his life. He and his siblings would oftentimes uh, have to forage up their own food while mom worked away from home uh, for days at a time in a tomato cannery. Did you know that Harland, when he became an adult, would bounce around from job to job and profession to profession for decades? 
The Indiana native worked as a lawyer in Little Rock, Arkansas for a while until uh, brawling with one of his clients in the courtroom destroyed his reputation. And that wasn't even the first time he switched careers due to getting in a fist fight. Did you know he later got into a shootout with another gas station owner shortly after opening uh, his uh, you know, first place to eat? A shootout that left a man dead. Or how at the age of 65, he nearly went bankrupt. Or how he traveled around the country in his mid-60s looking for suitable partners to sell his special fried chicken blend of 11 herbs and spices, unable to afford motel rooms, he often slept in his car. Colonel Sanders did not achieve lasting financial stability until his late 60s and early 70s. After working for over six decades, and he didn't semi-retire until the age of 73 when he sold the Kentucky Fried Chicken Corporation for $2 million and then got a salary to be a brand ambassador for the rest of his life. For this year's inspirational year-end suck, I searched for a story of someone finding success late in life after many, many failures. Someone who refused to give up no matter how many times they had to start over. I wanted to find a symbol of tenacity and grit and perseverance. Someone who didn't find consistent success until he was at an age where most people were already done working. Someone who just kept fighting long after I'm sure most people would have given up. That's a story that hits a lot different than someone finding success at 18 or 30 or 40 even 50, someone hitting their stride in their 60s and not really cashing in until their 70s, that's a story that I think should inspire damn near everyone who hears it, or at least entertain everyone who hears it. So let's hear it. Time for a Kentucky Fried biographical. Everyone's path is different in life. Please don't give up on yours just because it doesn't look like you think it should. Annual year-end review and also look to the future edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Welcome or welcome back to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, Sir Sucks a Lot, Level 6 Light Worker, Sad Boy Sauce Salesman. I wish I was a Giga Chad, but probably a Melvin. And you're listening. It's time suck. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise be to good boy Bojangles, and glory be to Triple M. We made it! Last episode of 2023. Uh, Continued happy holidays to you all. I hope you had a good Hanukkah, which I do know came early this year. I don't don't do great with uh, holidays, remembering holidays, and I definitely don't do great with moving holidays. Why can't all holidays stick to a specific date? And maybe also have the uh, the name and date Right, uh, like name of the month and then date in the name. Like I never forget the Fourth of July. It makes it very easy, right? I wish like Christmas was like Christmas December twenty fifth, uh, Thanksgiving November. You know, don't don't just like for Thursday. Just pick a date. Anyway, Happy New Year's Eve, Happy New Year's Eve December thirty first, and then on New Year's Day January first, uh, already another time still coming out. A lot to talk about today. Uh, if I if my voice sounds a little different, yeah, I got a little cold, but you know what? I'm not going to let it stop me. If Harlan, if Harlan Sanders could persevere through all he did, I'm pretty sure I can record something with a scratchy voice and uh, stuffy nose. Uh, yeah, lots to talk about. Fried chicken and so much more. Let's get Kentucky Fried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to spend the first half of today's episode telling the tale of the colonel, uh, which will be done almost entirely in a timeline starting with his birth. And then after a little recap of the colonel's life and why I chose, again, to tell his story today, uh, we'll transition to look back at this year's episodes and also at the wet, hot, bad magic summer camp, uh, my stand-up shows, uh, what a cool online community we have, even when they're fighting, uh, why I chose to end the Secret Suck, sunset the Time Suck app, and take a break from touring this next year. Uh, We'll look ahead at what I'm hoping uh, will come up in the bad magic community this next year. Now let's jump into our Kentucky Fried Timeline. Uh, after I do address some uh, defamation and libel. Uh, There are rumors that the colonel was racist, and they are, from what I can tell, totally unfounded. Most seem to come, and I'm not making this up, from this fucking weasel, Papa John. Seriously, Papa John's founder, John Schnatner, he tried to throw Harlan Sanders under the bus when he got in trouble, when John got in trouble for dropping N-bombs, saying that, well, Harlan never got in trouble for saying that word, except you can't find... Anybody else, uh, you know, like some fucking figure out there other than John Schnatner who said that he did that. And John and Harlan were never close. 
because Harlan died when John was 19 years old. So how the fuck would he know what Harlan was privately saying? Unless it was just rumor hearsay. So fuck Papa John. Uh, there were also rumors that Harlan was involved in the KKK. Nope. Those were actually investigated. Pretty serious accusation. Zero link, like literally zero, has ever been uncovered. It appears in true nonsensical, historical, revisionist, let's tear people down who are fucking probably better than ourselves for no good reason, fashion, that largely because of his look, because of the outfit he wore, the white suit worn by a white Southern man, the mustache, the goatee, a look suggested by a TV producer, by the way, uh, because that look is reminiscent of how some, emphasis on some, plantation owners used to possibly dress people started assuming all sorts of bullshit about harlan sanders uh but when you do some digging uh he was actually incredibly modern for his day he employed a disproportionate amount of women and non-white people and generous with his pay he was a fucking hothead he was a huge hothead but the rest of the stuff seems to be a bunch of bullshit so forget so forget that bullshit if you indeed heard it if harlan was alive now and heard you talking shit about him he'd probably fucking knock your ass out because he was feisty. Uh, that's definitely true. Uh, so uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's suck this guy in this uh, Kentucky Fried Timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. On September 9th, 19, or 1890, not 1980. 1890, uh, Harlan Sanders, the oldest of three Sanders children, was born to Wilbert and Margaret Ann Sanders of Henryville, Indiana, a little farming community in the southernmost part of the state that now sits less than 20 miles from the outer suburbs of Louisville. Harlan is the uh, uh, little 2,000 person uh, ish area's second most famous resident behind award winning blue, bluegrass fiddler uh, Charles Michael Cleveland. Or the Colonel is way more famous than Charles, but Charles is pretty impressive. Born completely blind in 1980. Uh, a childhood ear infection cost him 80% of his hearing in one ear, and he still went on to win, uh, uh, be a Grammy-nominated fiddler who's appeared on the Grand Ole Opry and on Prairie Home Companion. So, you know, maybe looking at Charles Michael Cleveland's music. Uh, why not? Uh, backing up almost a century to Harlan's childhood, the Sanders family grew up dirt poor, but not any more or less poor by the standards of the time and the place than most of their neighbors. Henryville was a community of mainly very low-income farmers. At the end of the 19th century, laboring on roughly 100-acre plots for what amounted to basic sustenance. The Sanders lived in a four-room house about three miles east of Henryville, a census-designated place that first got a post office in 1865. The area probably didn't have much more than a post office, some churches, bar or two, and a general store when Harlan lived there. The unincorporated area named Henryville in 1853 to honor Colonel Henry Ferguson, a colonel in the Pennsylvania militia. No shortage of colonels in this suck. It's been too long since we've had at least two colonels in one episode. Uh, this colonel purchased the land on which Henryville was established and helped persuade Pennsylvania Railroad officials to run a line through Clark County. Uh, taking an educated guess, I'd guess no more than 500 people lived in Henryville when Harlan was born. There's no census info since the town was not incorporated. Harlan's younger brother, Clarence Edward, born in 1892, and then his younger sister, Violet Catherine. I like these names. Born in 1895. Harlan's dad, Wilbert, said to be a mild, affectionate, and hardworking man. A good dude and a great dad. He worked the family's 80-acre farm until he broke his leg badly in a fall. Unable to handle the rigorous work of farming now uh, because, you know, they didn't, uh, they didn't fix broken legs quite as well back in the late 1800s as they do now. Wilbert had to find a job as a butcher. He worked out of Henryville in 1894 and 1895. And he would have probably kept doing that, but at some point in 1895, Wilbert died. Uh, just five years after Harlan's birth, leaving two sons and a daughter in the care of his wife, a lady described in a biography on the colonel as being stout-hearted, fatalistic, uh, devoutly religious. And the, uh, now she's in the unenviable position of being widowed at 30 with three young mouths to feed in rural Indiana. Uh, not much known about Wilbert's cause of death. Uh, perhaps he just fell ill, as many did back then, with some virus that took him down in the prime of his life. Uh, maybe he choked on a chicken bone. That'd be pretty fucking weird. Who knows? Also, uh, don't hear the name Wilbert much anymore. Please, after hearing this, if you know anybody who goes by Will, uh, start referring to them as Wilbert. If they say their birth name is actually just Will or that their legal name is William and they chose to go by Will instead of Bill, uh, please refuse to accept that. Insist that they are, in fact, Wilbert. 
and it's best to stop fighting it. It's a noble name. Maybe not a name fit for a king, but at least a name fit for a guy who would probably taste the king's food before he you know, took a bite to make sure it wasn't poisoned or something. Anyway, the Sanders struggled greatly in the wake of Wilbert's death. It was already especially hard to make a living as a farmer in 1895 in the wake of the Panic of 1893, the worst depression the U.S. had faced as a young nation. Uh, a variety of complex factors led to this so-called panic, including railroads expanding too quickly, taking on too much debt to do so, and also a great number of Americans taking their money out of their banks due to fear over financial turmoil in London, Argentina, and elsewhere abroad leading to economic troubles in America. Uh, people withdrew so much money, banks did begin to go under, which led to a panic, right? This vicious cycle of more people withdrawing more money, leading more banks to collapse, leading more people to withdraw more money, leading more banks to collapse, and so on. Uh, America's farmers arguably took the economic hit the hardest. They were now subject to high interest loans by remaining banks, banks quick to take possession of their farms when payments weren't made on these high interest loans. And, you know, properties were foreclosed upon and sold, which felt more like theft. And they'd be quickly, you know, yeah, auctioned off to opportunist real estate speculators. For about two years, the rest of 1895, all of 1896, much of 1897, Harlan's mom, Mag uh, Margaret Ann, aka Maggie, barely kept herself and her three kids fed by sewing and doing housework for others in the community. She wasn't able to farm the land herself and farming wasn't profitable enough at that time to be able to hire someone else to do it and have it be worthwhile. In 1897, when Harlan was seven, Maggie got a full-time job in a nearby tomato canning factory, a job just far enough away uh, with work days long enough that she would often not come home you know, at night, but instead stay in some sort of employee dormitory. And this was when, as I mentioned up top, Harlan first learned how to cook. All right, little dude, by the age of seven, He's the man of the house. He's in charge while mom is away. He does pretty well. And he'd already been cooking for a couple years. You know, he started at like five and uh, he's baking bread, cooking vegetables. He's okay with meat. Funny that the man now synonymous with fried chicken was initially better with bread and vegetables. Uh, also, can you imagine being in charge of your siblings when you're seven fucking years old? We've come across stories like this in numerous other sucks. And I know I always react with the same level of shock. I know stories like this were common at the time, but it's, it's crazy to me. Like, what were you doing at the age of seven? Me, I don't think I had any chores yet outside of maybe having to make my bed or keep my room kind of tidied up, like put my Legos away. I only start riding a bike, you know, uh, or I'd only started riding a bike a year, maybe two years earlier. I was playing with He-Man figures in the bathtub, still taking baths instead of showers. Right? Probably still using Johnson & Johnson, no tears shampoo, so I didn't burn my little baby eyes and cry. I was building castles out of Legos, playing Centipede and Chopper Command on my Atari. I mean, I'm sure I could have made myself a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but I don't think I could have even boiled water and make mac and cheese yet. I certainly was not helping to take care of my little sister, uh, Donna, on any level, who was two. No fucking way. She would, have, she would have died within a couple of days if I was put in charge of taking care of her. The Colonel will, many years later, love telling a story about the first time he took over the kitchen, uh, baked a loaf of bread atop a hot wood stove, and then proudly presented it to his mom at the canning factory. Other women on the, on the line all hugging and kissing him. Man, I have no such memories from that, from that age. Uh, Harlan would also uh, work to get the family some money. Again, when he's seven, he would start clearing brush and scrub wood for neighboring farmers. A few hours here, a few hours there. Kind of work that prisoners on a chain gang might do. In 1900, little Harlan, now 10, is working more hours doing this grunt work. And he gets fired by a neighbor for slacking on his brush clearing duties. He was caught lying on his back, daydreaming, listening to the sounds of nature. And Mama Maggie was furious. The colonel would later say that she told him, I'm afraid you're just no good. Here I am, left alone, with you three children to support, and you're my oldest boy, the only one that can help me, and you won't even work enough so somebody will keep you. I guess I'll never be able to count on you. Ouch! Then in a moment of extreme stress and frustration, she added cruelly, it looks like you'll never amount to anything. He's fucking 10. Nevertheless, he would carry the shame he felt upon hearing his mom tell him that for the rest of his life. Wanted to prove mama wrong. Well, he wasn't lazy. Wasn't a quitter. He was going to amount to something. Well, he would amount to a lot. It would just take traveling down a long and winding road for many, many years to get there. Uh, a month after his dismissal, he was already back at work doing, you know, what he was, uh, or during what was supposed to be summer break from school, excuse me, 
this time working as a coolie, aka a laborer, uh, for another man named Henry Monk, who probably had the biggest farm in the area at that time. Sanders, this little kid, will be up before dawn, plowing Monk's ground with a team of fucking mules for most of the day, driving these mules. Then he'd feed, water, milk the cows, uh, which inevitably occasionally kicked him. He'd work until 10 p.m. some days, getting his first calluses, uh, you know, blisters, learning the value of a hard day's work and the approving words of Kentucky historian John Ed Pierce. Harlan returned home with a new sense of dignity and more money than he'd ever had. He had learned now what it was like to be on his own, to do a man's work, make a living. After that, school seemed childish and a waste of time. Uh, By the age of 12, Harlan would be done with school. There was just no time for it. His poor family, they needed the money and he did what was needed. He'd feel a little embarrassed about his lack of a formal education for the rest of his life, but he shouldn't have, right? Life circumstances just did not allow him uh, to, you know, get the education he desired. Also, when Harlan was 12 in 1902, his mom married a man named William Broadus. And the Sanders family moved 80 miles north to Greenwood, Indiana, just outside Indianapolis. Not much known about William, other than he seemed like an asshole. Sanders and his only brother would both have a tumultuous, terrible relationship with him. His sister possibly also didn't care for him. Sources don't say how the two got along. Uh, Harlan and William, another Wilbert perhaps, got along so poorly that in 1903, Before uh, Sanders turned 13, he left home, mostly to get away from his stepdad, went to go live and work on another farm. So at the age of 13, done with his farm job, uh, he then moves into Indianapolis to take a job painting horse carriages. Then when he's 14, he returns to Southern Indiana to work again as a farmhand for a couple years. 1906, at the age of 15, this guy's got quite a work resume for a 15-year-old. Harlan takes a job working for an uncle of his in New Albany, Indiana. 20 miles away from his hometown of Henryville and just outside of Louisville, where he would take fares for a streetcar company. He learned how to chat with customers and make change. He was personable and well-liked, and he was grateful to be done with the back-breaking work of laboring on farms. But even tougher work lay ahead. Tensions were brewing between the U.S. and Cuba while Harlan worked in New Albany, and when a call for volunteers came, he jumped to the chance and he joined the army. Had to falsify his date of birth in order to do so since he was too young to join without parental permission. Before he left, he, he moved up to working as a streetcar conductor for his uncle. Uh, he'd work a lot of different jobs over the course of his life, and it seems like whatever the job was, he applied himself and did rise quickly through the ranks. Might not last long, might leave on bad terms, but also did seem to work really hard. Harlan's experience in the military was brief and dismal. He would later say that he spent most of his brief time in the army being seasick or shoveling mule shit. So that doesn't sound fun. Less than a year's time, he's honorably discharged in early 1907, sent home with the Cuban Pacification Medal. He'd lost 40 pounds off an already wiry frame down in Cuba, and the now real skinny 16-year-old landed in New Orleans, where he would catch a freight train a little while later up the Mississippi River, see St. Louis for the first time, and then see a lot more places. The feeling of riding the rails was addictive for Sanders, and for a few months, he traveled all around the South eventually arriving in Sheffield, Alabama, a little town that's part of the Florence Muscle Shoals metro area along the Tennessee River, where he had some family. His uncle worked there for the Southern Railway, and he got the 17-year-old Harlan the first of many railroad jobs, a position as a blacksmith's helper. This was a railroad job that uh, wasn't anywhere near a train and a brutal job at best. Made far worse in the colonel's later recollection, thanks to the blacksmith being a real mean old son of a bitch. Harlan's little brother Clarence, now 15, Met up with him in Sheffield after leaving home to just like Harlan, get away from their stepdad. So Willie must have truly been a mean bastard. After just two months in Sheffield, not sure about Clarence. uh, Harlan, though, moved 80 miles south to Jasper, Alabama, where he got a job cleaning out the ash pans of trains. Real grunt work from the Northern Alabama Railroad where they uh, would finish their runs. Right. Just more hard physical labor. Sanders progressed to become a steam engine stoker, a.k.a. a fireman. And worked that job for nearly three years until he was fired for, quote, insubordination after he got sick in 1909. Quickly found a new job in Jasper with the Norfolk and Western Railway, working again as a fireman. Also in 1909, Harlan marries one of the first girls he ever went on a date with, 21-year-old Josephine King, when he was still 18. He met her outside of a movie theater. They dated for just a couple weeks. Uh, Then they got married on June 15th. 
and they'd stay together for the next almost 40 years. A not very happy 40 years, as Sanders would later recollect. They seemed to have married less out of love for one another and more out of a sense of, well, that was what you're supposed to do. You know, when you get along well enough with somebody, you want to have sex with them and you get married because that's just what people did. Lucifina doesn't feel like it was a, a great time to be alive compared to now. Just over nine months after marrying, March 29th, 1910, the first of the couple's three kids is born, Margaret Josephine Sanders, right? Named after her mother and her grandmother. Uh, the colonel said to have a, uh, said to have had quite the libido, an energetic, passionate man in many ways, and they didn't take long to get pe- pregnant. Two years after the first child, April 23rd, 1912, Harlan Jr. is born. Took him a little longer the second time. Josephine might've been like, dude, get that thing away from me. I'm breastfeeding right now for fuck's sake. Something like that. Uh, shortly after Junior's birth, Harlan found a better job again as a, as a fireman, this time for the Illinois Central Railroad. And the family now relocated to Jackson, Tennessee. There, the Sanders family went through some kind of marital problems that Harlan would never discuss in detail. He just said that his job required him to frequently travel, often for several days at a time. And after returning home from one work trip, he walked into an empty house. The way he told it, he didn't even realize that his wife was that homesick. He was shocked, right? She just took their kids, moved back to Jasper without having a conversation with him about it. Now, that would be shocking. Uh, Think about that back in the days before cell phones or GPS tracking. Back when less than a third of households even had a landline telephone. You just show up at home and your family is just gone, right? Scrambling over to the neighbors or whoever your spouse is friends with to try and figure out where the fuck they went. Then having to hop on a train or maybe hopping into a Model T driving, but probably not because... Most people didn't even have cars yet. They were still impractical to take long distances because there weren't that many gas stations. And then when you show up to wherever you think they've gone, which is probably days, if not weeks later, you still don't know for sure that they're there until you actually lay eyes on them, right? I mean, you'd be used to it in a sense. That's just the way things were back then. But God, that would be way more stressful than it would be looking for somebody today. Well, Harlan traveled back to Jasper with the intention to kidnap his own children and bring them back. Went as far as he hid in the bushes of his in-laws We then thought better of it, ended up talking things out with Josephine, uh, and she agrees to take their two kids and move back into the family home in Tennessee, where Harlan now needs to work to get a job that doesn't require so much travel. While he continues working as a fireman for the time being, he also starts studying for a law degree at night, taking classes through LaSalle Extension University. He was inspired to become a lawyer after reading about Clarence Darrow, a man considered by many legal analysts to be the greatest American lawyer of the 20th century. Uh, We met Clarence in the Leopold and Loeb Perfect Murder Suck, episode 335 that came out this year, uh, back in February. Uh, Darrow would reach the height of his fame in the mid-1920s. Hopefully his name isn't pronounced Darrow. I I think it's Darrow. Uh, For his work in the Leopold and Loeb trial and also the infamous Scopes Monkey trial. While going to school, Harlan got fired from his job at the Illinois Central Railroad for getting in a, quote, brawl with a colleague. He was a, he was a spicy meatball. Uh, he'd probably been in a whole bunch of brawls prior to this. The word brawl comes up a lot in biographies of the colonel. Dude was not afraid to throw hands at all. After he got fired, he kept studying the law and took a new job as a fireman for the Rock Island Railroad base in Chicago. Had to move uh, for work. His wife, two kids, now moved back to Jasper for a bit to live with Josephine's folks where they will stay until he starts making money as a lawyer. Uh, Shortly after taking a job for the Rock Island Railroad, he has enough legal education to move and now practice law in Little Rock, Arkansas, where apparently you did not need to pass the bar exam to be a lawyer at that time. Pretty much anyone with just a bit of knowledge of the law uh, could round up some clients if they had enough salesmanship and just work as a professional attorney. There was very little uh, qualification, like like legal qualifications needed. Uh, Josephine and the kids moved to Little Rock to join Harlan after he made a whopping 2,500 bucks following signing up a bunch of clients thanks to being the first lawyer at the scene of a train wreck. Uh, That was a small fortune at that time, somewhere around uh, $75,000 today. Harlan would now practice law in Little Rock for about three years, and then his law career came to a swift and dramatic end. (laughs) I love this. When he punched out a client of his in the courtroom during trial in front of the judge, who had him immediately arrested and charged with assault. And then he was not exactly welcome to practice law in Little Rock after that. Uh, Sanders would later say he, quote, knocked himself out of a job. God, I, I, I just imagine like whoever he knocked out seeing one of his Kentucky Fried Chicken commercials on TV decades later. Uh, honey, come here quick. Hey, it's a guy I told you about. Oh, he's back on TV. That son of a bitch was supposed to help me sue my boss. 
for not providing a safe work environment. And when I told him I, I didn't think he's making a good case for me, knocked me out in front of the whole goddamn courtroom. Now that hot-headed prick's making millions slaying a chicken. What a strange world. Actually, I want to believe that he found uh, his client, uh, found out that he was like a, like a pedophile or a wife beater or something. And decided he wasn't going to represent him anymore. And that led to an argument. And that led to Harlan just whooping his ass. Uh, Harlan was a good-sized guy. Uh, around six feet tall. Lean and mean, 200 pounds. And he was said to be tough as nails. No one fucks with the colonel. No one. Ah! It's 1915 now. 25-year-old Harlan. Feels like he should be 45. Based on how many jobs he's had already. Had already. He has to move back to Henryville, Indiana and live with his mom, uh, who's moved back there, obviously, uh, after apparently divorcing Harlan's stepdad, I, I think. Uh, I don't think based on some record searches that Margaret Ann and William Broadus, Maggie and Billy were ever actually legally married. Scandalous. So I'm making some assumptions here, but I think that they're done now. Uh, one of the many low points in Harlan's adult life, he's feeling like a huge failure, right? Mom's words looks like you'll never amount to anything, probably ringing in his ears. Back in Henryville, Harlan gets a job as a laborer for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Feels like he's moving backwards in life. After staying several months with Mama Maggie, in 1916, the Sanders family now moves to Jeffersonville, right across the Ohio River from Louisville. After Harlan gets a job selling life insurance for the Prudential Life Insurance Company, another big career switch, right? The childhood farmhand, former streetcar conductor, railroad man, then lawyer, now a life insurance uh, salesman at the age of just 26. On October 15th, 1919, the couple's third and final child, Mildred Marie Sanders, is born. And right around that same time, Harlan gets fired for insubordination. Hothead! Right? At least it's not a brawl this time. Not that we know of. Uh, luckily, he was, he was not a quitter. Every time he got knocked down, he got right back up again. Uh, did you know that the Chumbawamba song, Tub Thumping, was written about Colonel Sanders? I get knocked down, but I get up again. You're never going to keep me down. I get knocked down. It's fucking Colonel Sanders. That's who they were talking about. Or they weren't. But, but maybe it could have been. Actually, that song is about somebody drinking way too much. And Harlan uh, was a teetotaler. He was not much of a drinker. Uh, Harlan does quickly get another sales job with the Mutual Benefit Life of New Jersey Company based in Louisville. It's a fucking weird. I, I think just like they had an office based in Louisville even though the source says based in Louisville, I don't think a company called the Mutual Benefit Life of New Jersey would have their you know, national headquarters in Kentucky. But who knows? And then following selling more insurance, this dude drastically switches shit up and jumps into another completely different career field. Farmhand, streetcar conductor, railroad man, lawyer, insurance salesman, and now riverboat captain. Almost actually. 1920 at the age of 30, Sanders, who'd made a bunch of business contacts when he joined the Rotary Club, after moving to Jeffersonville and selling insurance, well, he raises money to launch a ferry boat company operating a single boat on the Ohio River between Jeffersonville and Louisville. He saw a need and just went for it. Far from the last time he'll do something like this. Uh, there was a ferry already, but it was slow and outdated and there was easy enough demand for a competitor. So Harlan hits up everybody he knows, sells shares to raise money for a ferry company that he'll incorporate. Once he has the necessary capital, he buys a boat called Froman M. Coots weird fucking name then less than two years later sells his shares in the company for twenty two thousand dollars equivalent to around four hundred thousand dollars today so well done colonel the colonel's back baby he's kicking ass again more than ever uh ultimately this business venture gambler uh took most of that ferry money and uses it to establish another company manufacturing something so random again do you care to guess what it was i'll give you two clues that will not help you it's not fried chicken and has nothing to do with the railroad. Lamps. Dude just randomly jumps into the lamp game. Uh, Harlan opens up a lamp company that makes specifically acetylene lamps. So now it's farmhand, street con uh, car conductor, railroad man, lawyer, insurance salesman, ferry owner, lamp magnet. But right after he opens his business, Delco, a tech company and subsidiary of General Motors, makes a small electric generator that does a much, much better job providing light to the same people that are, were going to buy his lamps. And they also sell it on credit. And so now Harlan loses his ass. Just like that, he's out of the lamp game forever. 1923, the Sanders family moves again to Winchester, Kentucky, just outside of Lexington. And what does he do? Something totally unrelated to all the shit he's done already, of course. 
The family moves to Winchester after Harlan gets a job selling tires for the Michelin Tire Company. So, you know, kind of, I mean, I guess not totally different because it's also a sales job, right? But now it's farmhand, streetcar conductor, railroad man, lawyer, insurance salesman, ferry owner, lamp magnet, tire salesman. (laughs) He's only 33. At the age of 33, he quickly becomes a top tire salesman in Kentucky. Then the very next year, 1924, Michelin closes a major manufacturing plant and they fucking lay him off. Son of a bitch! He gets knocked down! Uh, He's out of the tire game forever. And after losing his job, he totals the family car in an accident that leaves him with a nasty head wound, badly split in his scalp. And now soon the Sanders family will have to move again. Without a car now, he's hitchhiking around Winchester looking for a new job. Another low point in his life. He gets picked up, just by chance, by the general manager of Standard Oil of Kentucky. The two hit it off, and that guy asked him to run a Standard Oil gas station in Nicholasville, Kentucky, 30 miles west of Winchester, also just outside of Lexington. I love it. Farmhand, streetcar conductor, railroad man, lawyer, insurance salesman, ferry owner, lamp magnet, tire salesman, now gas station manager. And he was in the army for about a year. Dude was packing a lot of lives into one life. In Nicholasville, Harlan runs a gas station for the next five or so years. And according to one of his biographies, does not take any shit from unruly customers or would-be robbers. He makes a name for himself around town by getting into, quote, several brawls (laughs) in Nicholasville. Colonel was a scrappy son of a bitch. When he became the face of KFC decades later, I bet a whole bunch of people had moments of, I'll be damned, that son of a bitch, he fucking busted my jaw. Now he's a chicken king. The station in Nicholasville makes the Sanders family good money, enough to send their oldest daughter, Margaret, Maggie, to college in 1928, and the colonel is now 38 years old. Life going great for the colonel. Best it's ever gone now. But then in 1930, the U.S. enters a little period of, oh, economic disaster. I'm guessing you've heard of it. The Great Depression. Businesses start closing left and right nationwide, even good, well-run businesses that were kicking ass just months earlier. And 40-year-old Harlan service station is one of the casualties, right? And he's back to square one again. Luckily, within a few months, the Shell Oil Company, familiar with the success of his Nicholasville station, offers Harlan a job running one of their service stations in North Corbin, Kentucky, a town of a few thousand people next to Corbin, a town of less than 10,000, about 85 miles south of Lexington, about halfway between Lexington and Knoxville, Tennessee. At this new location, you will not have to pay a franchise fee or rent, but will instead pay the corporation a percentage of his sales. So he'll only make money if the station makes money. And the salesman in Harland loves this incentivization. And it will lead over the course of many years to his Kentucky Fried Chicken business. Here in North Corbin, Harlan will get in a bunch more brawls. And he'll participate in a shootout that leaves a colleague dead. A gas station turf war. The most unexpected moment I came across looking into his life. Who knew there would be so much violence in a Colonel Sanders suck? Oh, fuck yeah, bro. I find it very entertaining. Sanders' new station is just off of Highway 25, which was a very busy road at that time. It was the main thoroughfare in the area prior to the construction of Interstate 75, which didn't start being built in the area until the 60s. It was a great location for a gas station, but there was already another more you know, uh, visible station more established station right across the highway ran by a guy we'll meet in a second who was also a very fiery dude. This other location would be a major challenge for Sanders, uh, but initially a bigger challenge was how tough just the neighborhood in general was. Sanders station was located in what was called Hell's Half Acre by locals. Owing to the infamous frequency of fights and gun battles, the area was a hot spot for bootleggers and some loosely organized crime figures. Luckily, the colonel gave no fucks. Luckily, he was good at kicking ass, as good as he would later become at frying tasty-ass chicken. During his time in North Corbin, Sanders kept a loaded handgun under the cash drawer and a loaded shotgun he called his hog rifle (laughs) next to his bed at home. And he'd bring that handgun with him into a gas station turf shootout. The man who ran the station across the street was a local tough guy named Matt Stewart, also known for not taking anybody's shit. From the time Sanders moved in, these two fiery businessmen seemed destined for a showdown. Sanders, right after taking over his new business, well, he painted a big sign on a railroad wall near the highway, directing, you know, traffic getting off the highway over to his gas station. And Stewart didn't care for that. He was livid. So he quickly responds, 
by painting that sign over and then writing information directing traffic back to his place. Now Sanders is livid. So he pays Stewart a visit, tells Stewart if he ever does something like that again, he will, quote, blow his goddamn head off. That's a Colonel Sanders quote. Not the type of quote I initially expected to find, right? The nice grandpa looking dude with the white suit, mustache, goatee, glasses. When he was a younger man, uh, once told a competing gas station manager that if he fucked with the sign again, he'd blow his goddamn head off. Well, following that threat, Sanders goes and repaints the sign back to the original directions he'd put up there. Then Stewart, not afraid of Harlan, despite the threat, is soon spotted again back at that railroad wall painting over Sanders' sign. Uh, When word reaches Harland, he is conferring with two Shell officials, his district manager, Robert Gibson, and a local Shell supervisor, H.D. Shelburne. These guys were also apparently not men you fuck with when it comes to gas station money. These three dudes all grab firearms, jump into a car, speed down to the sign with a shootout on their minds. When they get near, they spot Stewart. He's up on the ladder, painting Harlan's instructions over. When he hears them approaching, he hops down off the ladder, grabs his own gun that he had ready for this. And he just opens fire. No one seems certain who shot first, but bullets flew. They were not warning shots. These guys are not fucking around. The Shell district manager takes three to the chest, dies almost instantaneously. Dude dies over gas station advertising fucking argument. Sanders, after emptying his own handgun, runs into incoming gunfire, grabs Gibson's gun out of his dead hand and starts shooting again. This shit's insane. He and Shelburne quickly flank Stewart, who's hiding behind a wall. The future colonel finds an angle, shoots Stewart in the shoulder shoulder, at almost the exact same moment that Shelburne shoots him in the hip. Uh, Stewart then supposedly cries out, don't shoot Sanders, you've killed me. And this really weird battle is now over. Uh, Sanders luckily did not kill Stewart. Uh, He will survive the shooting and Sanders will not go to prison for murder, but he will go to jail. When the police show up, they arrest everybody and the case goes to court. When all is said and done, Sanders and Shelburne will have their charges dismissed, and then Stewart will be given 18 years in prison for murder. Then two years later, Stewart is appealing his conviction and is shot and killed by a deputy sheriff who, it was rumored, had been paid by the family of the slain Robert Gibson to kill him. Life fucking wild in North Corbin. So much drama in the NK, NCK. Damn it, I messed it up. <laughs> I was trying to flip that LBC. Uh, the colonel was a fucking gangster. Had he not won that turf war, there would very likely not be KFC today. Uh, One of history's many weird moments. So with his competition first in prison, then literally dead, Sanders' new business now flourishes. Uh, He took care of all the new customers he was getting, turned many of them into regulars. His station was the first in the area to offer oil checks, free air pumping, other services still novel in most of Kentucky. He and Josephine also quickly noticed that many of the drivers who come through are asking, you know, where they can find something to eat. And there wasn't much in the area at that time to direct folks to. So, excuse me, Sanders sees another opportunity. Uh, Just like he cooked for his siblings when he was a little kid. Well, he's been cooking for his own family now. And sometimes he'll invite travelers to come in and join them if he's made extra. And it now occurs to him, why not make some extra food money on the side, right? And it's also the depression. Everybody's looking for a little hustle. There's a small room he wasn't using attached to the station. So Sanders buys some linoleum on credit for 16 bucks, moves the family dining room into this room. And now has a cafe, farmhand, streetcar conductor, army man, railroad man, lawyer, insurance salesman, ferry owner, lamp magnet, tire salesman, gas station manager, gunslinger, now short order cook. Harlan would have food ready at 11 a.m. Since most people in the area ate lunch between 11 and a little past noon. If no one came in and asked for food by noon, well, then the family would eat it. If people did show up, well, they'd sell it to them and then make themselves more food later. Uh, Sanders made all his Southern favorites, uh, ham, biscuits, greens, of course, fried chicken, cooked in a big skillet like all good Southern cooks. This was the first form of what would eventually become his Kentucky fried chicken. We've got a ways to go. Rather than an afterthought uh, to a full tank of gas, the food itself was good enough to soon become a customer draw. So much so that Harlan changes the name of his business from Sanders Service Station to Sanders Service Station and Cafe. Then, as the food business continues to expand, Changes it again to Sanders Cafe and Service Station. Later, when a four-room shack next door goes up for sale, Sanders takes it over and turns it into a little motel restaurant called Sanders Court and Cafe. Right, This is all going on during the Great Depression. Uh, 1932, backing up a little bit. Tragedy strikes the Sanders family 
when their only son, Harlan Jr., at the age of just 20, perfectly healthy, just a week or so before, dies of blood poisoning he gets during a routine hospital visit. Harlan barely has time to grieve. He's a cook. He's the business owner. He's got to keep working to keep everyone else fed. Uh, it seems like he will reflect more on this loss later in life when he will lament that he would have never sold off his business to investors if his son would have still been alive, as his dream was to hand over the business to him. Speaking of business, despite this strategy, Sanders' little business does so well that in 1935, he becomes a colonel, an honor bestowed upon him by the governor, Ruby LaFoon, who had visited his motel, gas station, and cafe. Uh, what a name he had. Guess, guessing no one ever referred to him as LaFoon the buffoon. Uh, let me explain really quick how the title of Kentucky Colonel works. I've always wondered, actually. Uh, not always. It's not like I fucking stayed awake at night as a kid. How does it work? But I've thought about it. Uh, it's the highest honor uh, the state of Kentucky can bestow upon a resident. It's a lot like how uh, the king or queen of England can grant somebody knighthood. It's just a nice honorary title. You don't get any uh, extra legal abilities or anything. You don't get to shoot fireballs. You don't get to be a wizard. Uh, the Kentucky Colonel title awarded by the governor to civilians age 18 or over for noteworthy accomplishments, contributions to civil society, remarkable deeds, or outstanding service to the community, state, or nation. And it's not a super rare thing, actually. Since 1813, over 350,000 people have received the Kentucky Colonel Commission. A lot of colonels roaming around Kentucky right now. Probably have a, a, a few colonels listening to this colonel suck. So it's cool, but it's not like he was uh, throwing a parade or anything. He got a certificate in the mail, had the option to ask to be referred to as a colonel, which he will uh, clearly choose later in life. For the first years of his cafe's operation, Sanders Food, uh, not a huge source of income, more just a way to keep people coming back, you know, get gas and uh, repairs, whatever. Uh, motel was pretty profitable. Uh, but then by the mid-1930s, the food itself, you know, was the Sanders' main source of income. And the most popular item on the menu was fried chicken which was a big dish in the South at that time amongst both white and black Southerners, but not a restaurant dish when Sanders started making it. It was poor people's food and food almost always only cooked at home. Possibly without really knowing it, Sanders attempted to mass produce this venerated dish, uh, you know, years later, essentially the national food of the American South before anybody else did. In 1935, uh, the Colonel's Chicken gets a major exposure boost. Duncan Hines, a product of Kentucky, and a nationally known food critic, uh, the Duncan Hines, who later will have a line of baked good products you can still find today at the grocery store. I mean, who doesn't love a, a delicious Duncan Hines cake of brownie mix or the frosting? Well, he wrote about Sanders Cafe in his 1935 book, Adventures in Good Eating, which was the nation's first road food guide. So the first like travel guide around food. Sanders Cafe, according to Hines, was a very good place to stop en route to Cumberland Falls and the Great Smokies. Notable for sizzly, sizzling steaks, fried chicken, country ham, and hot biscuits. Not an incredibly detailed write-up, but a national write-up nonetheless. Sanders was a little bit upset that Hines didn't write more about him, and years later when he runs into the food critic and fellow entrepreneur at a convention, he will pistol whip him and permanently disfigure him. Or not do that. But it feels like that's something he could have done. Over the course of the last few years of the 1930s, Harlan does well enough to buy another motel in Richmond, Kentucky. Also, uh, Opens a furniture store and a plumbing supply store. Dude clearly loved to stay busy. Always looking for another deal. July of 1939, businesses had been uh, steady for, or business had been steady for years. And with the U.S. economy beginning to emerge from the Great Depression, Harlan feels like it's the time to expand business into a new state. So he and his wife purchased a motel almost exactly 200 miles away in Asheville, North Carolina. But then, a few months later, November of 1939, their original motel, gas station, cafe in North, in North Corbin, their main moneymaker, burns to the ground. More trials and tribulations for the colonel. Dude's 49 years old, just bought a, uh, you know, a few new businesses. He's trying to figure out how to run and make profitable, and now his moneymaker burns to the ground. July 4th, 1940, Harlan will reopen his original location as a motel with a 140-seat adjoining restaurant. And here at the Harlan Sanders Cafe, Harlan will perfect the recipe that will later make him famous. He was given some strong incentive to make it really good. Right as this dude was getting himself and his family out of the depression, the U.S. enters World War II. And with over 10 million American men enlisting or being drafted, and with a, a gas ration and other rations in effect, tourism dries up. By damn it. 
1941, due to this, Harlan forced to close the new Asheville Motel. There's just not enough people traveling to make it a fucking profitable business. He had just bought it less than two years earlier. Loses his ass on another business venture that doesn't work. That wasn't his fault. Also loses the Richmond Hotel. Can't tell for sure what happened with his furniture store or plumbing supply store, but he may have lost those as well because they're not talked about again. Also, not making enough money at his Corbin restaurant to pay the bills, so leaving his wife behind in Kentucky, he has to travel across the country to get a job in Seattle as a short order cook and restaurant supervisor at a place called Twin Teepees, which was a well-known downtown restaurant in Seattle until it burned down in 2001. And he'll work there for 10 months just paying bills. And while he's away, he uh, uh, left a woman who had been working for him for a few years, Claudia Leddington Price, in charge of the North Corbin Cafe. Josephine never really loved working in a restaurant. And by this point, she was able to step away. And Claudia may have been doing more than just helping the Colonel run things business-wise by the time he went to Seattle. She may have also been offering the Colonel some free rides on her bike. Scandal! The two had an ongoing affair for years. Not sure how many years and will later marry. More on her in a bit. Following his time in Seattle in later 1942, Harlan will run a few cafeterias for the government. And I love this random trivia, including one in the new government town of Oak Ridge, Tennessee where materials were being developed for the Manhattan Project. How random, right? Uh, Colonel Sanders, before he was a household name, might have very well cooked up some chicken and more for Major General Leslie Groves and others working with Oppenheimer to make the atomic bombs that would end World War II. By the time Harlan returns to Kentucky in either 1943 or 1944, he has refined his secret chicken recipe of 11 herbs and spices. Same recipe still used today by Kentucky Fried Chicken locations around the world. He's been whipping up chicken that was finger licking good as the company now advertises has been for years, but it wasn't until the 1940s that he really figured out how to cook uh, this chicken up, not just consistently, but quickly while working in Oak Ridge. He had the idea to fry chicken via nuclear fission, working with a small nuclear reactor. He built in his backyard. He would be able to fry 100,000 chickens in less than one second by splitting a single hydrogen atom or of course not. I do love the idea though that part of the secret of the old KFC recipe is nuclear reactions. Uh, he really did come up with a cool new way of making fried chicken, though. It was very novel. He'd initially pan-fried his chicken for years, which I said earlier with the, the traditional way of frying chicken in the South. But doing that, it, it wasn't fast enough to make things as profitable for himself and as reliable for his customers as he hoped. If he pan-fried chicken after an order was put in, well, the customer would have to wait, you know, about 30 minutes. If he cooked a batch in advance... He almost always had extra chicken to throw away at closing time. And as the day went on, of course, it, just didn't, it didn't taste as good. Anyone who's ever had uh, fried chicken for leftovers knows, you know, it just doesn't taste the same at all after a few hours. Although I do actually love grabbing a piece of cold fried chicken out of the fridge, but not for everybody. So Harlan first experiments with what was called French frying at the time, immersing chicken in a wire basket in deep fat. This cut cooking to, uh, time in half down to 15 minutes, but also produced chicken that was dry, crusty, and unevenly done, which was no bueno. So sometime between 1939 and 1945, sources vary wildly. I'm not sure the, the colonel knew himself. I'm not sure he could uh, remember exactly when. He started messing around with, his, with frying his chicken under uh, pressure in a newfangled utensil at that time called a pressure cooker. And eventually he arrived at just the right balance of pressure, cooking time, meat, fat, and fat filtration. The pressure method he employed sealed in the chicken's flavor, preserved its moisture, and gave it a soft finish, neither greasy nor crusty, and did that in eight or nine minutes. So winner, winner, literally chicken dinner. This method was perfect for getting quality chicken out quick to hungry customers and reduced the need to throw away chicken at the end of the day. 1947 now. 57-year-old Sanders has made it to World War II, perfected his chicken recipe. The economy's good. Business is booming. Personally, though, he's having problems. His marriage to Josephine has been on the rocks for years, and it was never one that seemed to leave either person tremendously happy or fulfilled. They've now been married for 38 years. Josephine, quiet, subdued, not a big people person. Harland, big personality, fiery, passionate, big people person. In addition to almost polar opposite personalities, according to a number of sources, it seems the main two problems in their marriage were Josephine, not enjoying cooking or the restaurant industry on any level, and apparently uh, not as sexual of a person as the colonel. Or maybe, she, uh, you know, he just didn't do it for her. Uh, their kids would even speak to this later. Colonel Sanders' daughter, Maggie, wrote in her book, The Colonel's Secret, 11 Herbs and a Spicy Daughter. 
Speaking of her dad's mistress and second wife, uh, Claudia, who we met earlier, it was evident from the beginning that her presence would create turmoil. Mother refused to accept that she alone could not satisfy father's physical needs. This is a weird shit to write about your dad. Uh, which from the very beginning of their marriage had seemed excessive to her. Neither promiscuous nor a whoremonger, father never le- nevertheless had a libido, which required a healthy, willing partner. He found one in young Claudia. Claudia's nephew, Don Leddington, would say of Harlan's needs. A lot of interesting people commenting on this. If Josephine wasn't interested in that part of his life, obviously he didn't just forget about that part. He found one he needed to find in other places. And there are other people who commented on the lack of uh, sexual compatibility between these two. Uh, Interestingly, despite common knowledge of the affair between Claudia and Harlan, no one seems to fault him a bunch over the affair, which I think says a lot about what people thought of Harlan and Josephine's marriage. So in 1947, when Harlan's 57, the two get a divorce. Despite the affair, it seems uh, to have been a, a pretty amicable parting. That may have been largely due to their finances at the time. The Corbin business was thriving. There was enough money for Josephine to be set up well for her retirement and for Harland and Claudia to live their lives also. Now in 1949, Harland, 59, Claudia, 47, get married. And the next year, 1950, Harland truly starts to morph into his colonel persona. He'd lost his first Kentucky colonel commissioning paperwork. And in late 49, he'd got recommissioned again as a colonel. And now he starts taking this commission real seriously. Grows a mustache, grows goatee, lets the hair on his head grow out a little bit longer than he previously kept it made a string tie out of gross gain ribbon, and he starts introducing himself as Colonel Harlan Sanders. And apparently friends and associates, uh, even though they went along with it, they first thought he was just joking. And then, you know, later realized, oh, this is something that's going to stick. We used to ask him when he was going to change the name of his place to Colonel Sanders Court and sell Colonel Sanders fried chicken. Finally, I think everybody sort of accepted it, a Corbin friend told one of his biographers. The re-Christian Colonel Sanders will eventually even go so far as to have his beard bleached and wear a white suit to complete the persona. Which is pretty strange, right? I mean, uh, to change your persona that way? What if your partner did that, right? Or your dad? I just picture Kyler coming home from college for Christmas break, and suddenly I'm dressed up in 18th century aristocrat clothing. And then when he starts, you know, cracking up, I'm insulted. Uh, The Baron does not accept your insolent mockery, young squire. I challenge thy to a duel. When I toss him one sword, I unsheath another. Uh, While a bit weird... Life also good for the colonel. He's in love. He's got his white mustache and goatee. He considered himself a, an actual colonel now. He's, he's even driving around town in a shiny new white Cadillac. Then in 1952, at the age of 62, he first franchises his secret recipe. He franchises the recipe to Pete Harmon of South Salt Lake, Utah, uh, owner-operator, owner-proprietor of one of the city's largest, most successful restaurants, the Dew Drop In. Harlan met Pete in 1951 at the National Restaurant Association's annual convention in Chicago. The two of them bonded over a disdain of both alcohol and smoking cigarettes. Uh, That's a real thing. This colonel hated a drunk and loathed a smoker. We all have our things, I guess. Maybe his stepdad was a drunk and a smoker. In the first year of selling Sanders product, restaurant sales for Harmon more than tripled, with 75% of the increase coming directly from sales of fried chicken. For Harmon, the addition of fried chicken was a way of differentiating his restaurant from competitors Right in Utah, a product hailing from Kentucky was unique. It, was, it evoked imagery of Southern hospitality. Don Anderson, a sign painter hired by Harmon, uh, was the one who then coined the name Kentucky Fried Chicken. After Harmon's initial success, he'll uh, want to keep working with the Colonel, and he'll partner with Sanders for the rest of his career. Later, doing things like developing and preparing the KFC system for franchising, uh, he worked to develop training manuals, product guides, other claims to fame, or the development of the bucket packaging and the emphasis on the finger-licking-good motto. He'll also later convince several other restaurant owners to franchise, and Sanders will make four cents a chicken, equivalent to about 44 cents a chicken today. Uh, he won't, however, however, get into a gunfight or even a brawl with Sanders, so they were apparently they weren't like that close. Before all this business expansion, though, life throws Sanders another unexpected curveball, another big setback and low point. 1955, in anticipation for construction of Interstate 75, that will be cutting through Corbin, Kentucky the next decade. State Highway 25, that highway where Sanders Restaurant was located next to an exit, is rerouted. And the rerouting means that Sanders Cafe is now several miles off the beaten path. And it fucks his business up enough um, to basically destroy it. Right? Sanders tried to stop the rerouting by gathering up an armed posse, riding on horseback 
of course, in a Civil War officer's uniform with the colonel leading the charge to the homes of several county officials, killing some and tarring further than others. But the government refused to bend his will. So he eventually had to lay down a sword or he was just really bummed about the whole situation. Yeah, business slowed down so much. He was forced to sell his beloved restaurant within months of the change at the age of 65. Now the restaurant tour doesn't have a restaurant. Sanders will later say this, uh, you know, might've been the lowest point in his life. He'd worked so hard for so long. He'd had about, you know, a dozen different careers, huge highs, a lot of lows. And he was banking on his always busy Corbin restaurant, giving him and Claudia one hell of a retirement. But now after losing money, getting rid of his failing business, he's nearly broke again. This all hits the Colonel so hard. He starts smoking crack. Yes, crack. And within a few months, he's trading his precious fried chicken for crack in alleys all around North Corbin. And on days he doesn't have any chicken, the colonel is giving up his sweet, sweet ass for that sweet, sweet crack. And it's rumored that in the late 50s, uh, damn near everyone living in North Corbin took at least one spin riding the colonel's very used bicycle. Or maybe the news didn't hit him that hard. Maybe the, the crack didn't exist yet. But he was sad. He had a little bit of savings left. Social security check of $105 a month. He had a smattering of, of restaurants in Utah selling his chicken for four cents a, you know, a chicken. Selling his, you know, special recipe. But it's, it's only enough to barely pay the bills. He has no more employees. It's just uh, he and his second wife, Claudia. And now for a brief time, the two of them will whip up his original blend of 11 herbs and spices at home and ship it to the few restaurants paid to sell his chicken. Now, what does Sanders do at this point? Does he give up? Does he accept his lot? Be the guy who used to be a chicken slinger? No, he gets to work again. His wife will later say that she wasn't worried. She figured uh, he would come up with something else, you know, even if he was worried. She said, the colonel might say he didn't know what to do, but we who knew and understood him knew that it wouldn't be long before he would know exactly what to do. I love her faith in him. Sanders heading into his late 60s now, comes up with a new plan, and soon he'll be hitting the road again. He makes a bunch of phone calls, goes over all the contacts he'd made over the years in the restaurant industry to find places he thought would be best in the country to sell his chicken. And then he hops in his car, often alone, drives all over America to sell them on his secret recipe. The salesman's back. Right? Sometimes Claudia comes with him. Despite really needing to make some money, the two of them uh, won't just accept anyone. They try and think long-term, refuse to act desperate even at this point in their life. The colonel will later recall, my wife and I went way over in Illinois once. It was 1,500 miles round trip. We got in there just after dark, and as soon as I looked at the daggone place, I was afraid the trip was for nothing. I got out of the car, went around to see what the back end looked like. They had a glass door in the kitchen I could see in, and I knew immediately I didn't want to put the chicken in there. So I went back to the car, and we come on home. The owner don't know yet today that I ever did see that joint. I love that at this point, still focused on quality, right? This chicken was his baby. He wasn't going to give it to just anybody, not even when money was tight. Right When traveling alone, he'll uh, now sleep in the back seat of his Cadillac to save money. Also in the back of his Cadillac are bags, a seasoned flour, his precious pressure cooker, some material branded with the words Kentucky Fried Chicken, and a few bottles of aspirin because a lifetime of busting his ass has left him with a pretty serious case of arthritis in his hands. He'll don a black suit for these early trips. He'll start wearing the white suit in a few years, looking a lot like the image of the colonel we think of today. One of those fist fights helped his arthritis too. Uh, Dave Thomas, who would later go on to become the founder of Wendy's, remembers meeting the colonel during this era. He recalled, I never had seen a black suit like that in my life. The coat had long tails and fit him perfectly. His grain goatee was perfectly trimmed and he carried a gold tip cane. Colonel Sanders was one of a kind. He introduced himself and asked if I knew him. I pretended I didn't, even though I knew all about him. He sat down over a cup of coffee and he talked to me like an old friend. I've never met a better salesman. When he left, I had a sense this man was going to change my life. Maybe this colonel in a white Cadillac had something. Thomas would also add, food is a personal thing and it's tied closely to family life. People want to know the values of the person who's ladling out the goods. Harlan Sanders stood for values that people understood and liked. The colonel had really learned how to leverage his persona and went to great lengths to present himself as an exaggerated, larger-than-life Southern caricature now. He was a showman. He emphasized his humble, down-home origins, played up his country lingo, dropping extra dead gumbits, and don't you sees in conversations. Acting his own, as his own publicist, he also talked uh, his way onto all kinds of local TV morning shows around the country to promote his brand. Once booked as a guest, he would put on a cooking demonstration with his pressure cooker, and wearing his suit with his gold-tipped cane, he'd hand out drumsticks to the audience. When a restaurant chose to adopt Kentucky Fried Chicken, the colonel would make a public appearance, 
sometimes even bringing along Claudia in a full dress antebellum ensemble and introducing her to customers as the Colonel's Lady. On these memorable occasions, he would cook the chicken himself in the back. Then he'd later remember, when I got a supply of orders ahead, I'd go out and do what I called a little colonelin. <laughs> I'd take off my apron, dust the flour off my pants, put on my vest, long-tailed coat, gold watch chain, and go out into the dining room and knock motherfuckers to the ground. No, he'd talk to the guests. I would love it if he just fucking knocked a few people out of these things. Uh, it was during the early years of him hustling around like that when some TV producer told him that a white suit would pop better on TV. Really make him stand out. It would give him a, a, a visual signature, you know, more unique in a business where image is so important. And he obviously took his advice. In the late 50s, Sanders was like a, a traveling evangelist and his gospel was fried fucking chicken, baby. By 1960, the now 70-year-old chicken slinger had more than 200 outlets for his chicken, extending all the way up into Canada. He and his wife, Claudia, bought themselves a new big white house in Shelbyville, Kentucky, in between Lexington and Louisville. They had a new restaurant and headquarters in Shelbyville as well. A small staff, including an accountant, and Harlan was known to drive around town in a gold Rolls Royce with the words Kentucky Fried Chicken painted on both sides. Oh my God, I love it. Rolling around in his rolls, walking around with his cane like some sort of fried chicken pimp. Yo, 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 suck for his pimp, I was just Chicken Joe. I got to admit why I cribbed some of my drip, stole some of my flow. White suit, gold tip cane, a rose back in 1960. Clearly, the colonel was an OG pimp, not just some hip from the sticks, yo. Sanders flexing on his chicken fried success, dressed like a shotgun loving Dirty South version of Elliot Ness. Colonel never got into the sex game as far as we know, but with his swagger and charisma, he would have been a legendary pimp for show. Put some respect on the Sanders name, pimp of the chicken game, and I am playing. You dig? You feel me? You hear what I'm saying? Well, thank you, Chicken Joe. Always nice when he stops by. Uh, now, thanks to all his tireless self-promotion, people wanting to sell the Colonel's chicken are coming to him instead of him having to drive to them. Uh, one of the couples who will come to him were Earl and Winifred Smalley. The Colonel will change the Smalley's life in the best of ways, an example of many lives they changed. Right? How it illustrates how popular the Colonel's fried chicken was, how powerfully it could increase the profits of various little mom pa diners, roadhouses, random restaurants across America and Canada. In 1969, the New York Times would run a profile on the Smalleys. Incredibly hardworking, both had been brought up on farms, just like the Colonel. They'd been grinding away at a tiny Ma Pa restaurant in Warsaw, Indiana for years, and it barely supported them. When they met the Colonel, Earl was working around 65 hours a week, getting up before dawn to clean and prep the place, then staying until closing. Winifred worked 45 hours and raised their kids. From 1957 to 1963, their place would gross between $45,000 and $55,000 a year. But after expenses, the two only actually took home about $3,000 years, uh, $3, a year total, right? Between them both. Then in 1964, they borrowed $20,000 to buy franchise rights for KFC. Huge risk for a couple only making $3,000 in profit a year. Well, that gamble pays off big time. Within 10 months, they paid all that money back. Their very first year selling the Colonel's chicken, they took home after expenses a profit of $30,000. Literally 10 times the money they made the year before. And that story, not an exception, right? It was the rule. And how cool is that? The Colonel, not the only person by far getting rich off of his chicken. With stories like these, Harlan did not need to be a traveling salesman for KFC, right? As I mentioned, his chicken, the success it's bringing, his business partners doing all the talking he needs. Now you had to apply to be a partner, right? Like the Smallies, you had to pay uh, an increasingly costly franchise fee. Uh, navigating all of his expansion for the Colonel is getting tricky as he starts to go into international waters more and more outside of Canada uh, in his 70s. Uh, mostly the colonel is, is doing this, uh, by the way. He's in charge, but he does have a good staff to help him. And no one on his staff was more important than Pete Harmon, right? The guy who, who first bought his recipe, brought it to Utah. Pete will, is his business partner. Harmon, the unheralded hero of the Kentucky Fried Chicken story, the company's virtual co-founder. A quiet and unassuming man more than anyone else. He was the architect of Kentucky Fried Chicken Incorporated. He was the one who thought the business should just be called Kentucky Fried Chicken. He conceived of uh, Kentucky Fried Chickens as standalone restaurants would push the colonel away from attaching the company name to a random assortment of very different kinds of cafes and restaurants with different menus. He would move the company into what it looks like today, uniform menus, stores that look the same. Also, as I mentioned, invented the bucket, which after the colonel himself, you know, 
probably the chain's most recognizable symbol, and the guy who created the slogan, Finger Licking Good, which became synonymous with the brand, uh, as much as the colonel himself. He'll remain a top figure in the hierarchy of the company when it moves forward through view, future uh, various corporate owners. Going back to 1964, the company's rapid expansion has led to more than 600 locations. And while now thriving financially, the colonel's annual profit before taxes is running around $300,000, roughly $3 million today, but Harland is fucking tired. So he sells he and Claudia's company for $2 million. Might not sound like a lot for all he's built, but that equates to about $20 million today. And he'll never have to worry about money again now, right? But he keeps working. He likes to work. He just didn't want to work all the time. He once said, work don't hurt nobody. Work is wonderful for you. You'll rust out quicker than you'll wear out. Hail Nimrod. You can work too much, as I've always known on some level and found my own personal limit this past few years. But also, I do think some amount of work, right? Volunteering leads to really diving into a hobby, something, staying active, right? It keeps you younger. Harlan wanted to sell his company for years before he did. His daughters weren't interested in running the whole thing. And with his son dead, he had no one to pass it down to. He knew it had become too much for him, but didn't want to sell to just anybody. He wanted to sell to the right person. Well, that right person would turn out to be John Y. Brown Jr., an aggressive young Kentucky lawyer, then only 29 years old, a man who will later become governor of Kentucky. Brown was tall, handsome, bright, athletic, persuasive, just like the colonel, charming as hell. The senior Brown was a prominent Kentucky lawyer and politician, also the son of a tenant farmer, and he had taught his son, John Jr., the same devotion to hard work that Colonel Sanders learned two generations before. At the age of 16, Brown was earning $700 a month selling vacuum cleaners door to door. Fucking love it. Doing that at 16, right? We got a hustler. As a freshman at the University of Kentucky, he became a salesman for Encyclopedia Britannica, made $500 during his first weekend on the job. That dude was slick. Working all through his years in college and law school, he eventually becomes a district sales manager for Britannica, supervising the work of 30 men, earning $25,000 a year. Also on both the golf and swimming teams in his spare time. After graduation, he turns down a, a sales job that pays $75,000 a year. A lot of money back then, like crazy money. Turns it down in order to go into practice with his father. Then the young sales genius and the old fried chicken genius get together in June of 1963, when the colonel asked Brown to go with him, uh, to excuse me, the colonel asked Brown to come work for him full time as his attorney, and Brown turned him down. He wanted to work with the colonel in a very different way. The two men fell into polite conversation about the colonel's favorite topic, fried chicken. Though the colonel was, well, you know, well known throughout Kentucky, few people outside the food business realized at this point the true extent of his success. Brown didn't even know how, quite how successful he was. He was amazed to learn that the colonel had hundreds of franchisees scattered around the country and in Canada. When I heard that, he said years later, I imagined that he had salesmen everywhere. I said, well, colonel, how many salesmen do you have out there in the field? And he said, oh, we don't solicit. We don't believe in solicitation. I was flabbergasted. It was a one-man operation. The colonel was the whole show. And with my sales background, I began to think what you could do with this business if you had a really aggressive sales program. By the end of their conversation, the colonel was considering letting Brown take over the franchising of a new chain of barbecue joints the colonel wanted to launch, right? In his 70s, still tossing out new ideas, not content with just the success of KFC. Dude had a fucking motor on him that would not quit. Uh, Brown quickly acquired financial backing from Jack Massey, multimillionaire businessman in Nashville, and set about opening his first store and studying the barbecue business. But by October, he concluded that barbecue only had regional appeal and that the real money was in chicken. Accordingly, he and Massey decide the thing to do is to buy out the colonel, franchise his chicken in a real way. Uniform restaurants, uniform menus, right? Like his business partner Harmon thought about. The way we see chains today, the way McDonald's was already popping off back in the 60s. When the two men called the colonel in Shelbyville in October of 1963 and made their offer, the colonel answered without hesitation that a sale was out of the question. And then he made mildly disparaging remarks about city slickers. <laughs> Brown and Massey, argued that the colonel should have time to enjoy his life now, that if he died before selling out, much of his estate would probably go for taxes. They offered him $2 million, some stock in the new proposed company, and a continuing relationship with KFC as the company's advisor and living image. They promised that quality control would be number one priority. They swore no one would ever tamper with his precious chicken recipe. The colonel was still hesitant. He knew the proposal was logically sound, but didn't feel right, right? Can a father sell his child? For the next several weeks, the colonel meditated while Brown wooed him. 
Brown, man, I, I love this guy. Crisscrossed the country, talked to the colonel's daughters, grandchildren, nephews, preachers, bankers, accountants, franchisees, everyone who was close to Harlan or would be affected by the sale. He wanted to work with the colonel that bad. He knew this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. Finally, on January 6, 1964, the colonel gives in, signs a contract. The deal completed on March 6th when stock is transferred and the colonel given a down payment of $500,000. Under the terms of the contract, the colonel would retain rights to Canada and the new company would get the rest of the world minus England, Florida, Utah, and Montana, four areas that the colonel had already assigned control of to existing business partners like Pete Harmon, who's running Utah, and his daughter Maggie, who's in charge of Florida. In addition to his two mil, the colonel will receive a lifetime salary of $40,000 a year, soon increased to $75,000. In addition to organizing a management team recruited largely from among uh, existing franchisees, it's nice that they rewarded loyal early adopters, Brown took four steps shortly after the sale that will prove important in the company's subsequent growth. First, he promotes the shit out of the colonel. Professional wrestling was just starting to become a major draw around the country. Despite his advanced age, thanks to a consistent weightlifting regimen and high-protein, mainly chicken breast-based diet, the colonel's fucking strong, and he still knows how to brawl. So the colonel will crisscross around the country in a 20-city series of matches where he will battle superstar Billy Graham, predecessor to Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Stone Cold Steve Austin, and more. Sunday, 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 in the Corbin, Kentucky arena off I-75 next to the Holiday Inn Express near Bubby's Barbecue, superstar Billy Graham, not the evangelist, but the man with bigger biceps than the almighty himself, faces off in a last man standing cage match against the Kentucky brawler, hair trigger Harlan, the Colonel. Don't miss the most important wrestling match to roll through Corbin, Kentucky all year. We'll tell you the whole seat, but you only need the edge. Okay, maybe Brown didn't use the Colonel in that kind of promotion. Uh, missed opportunity for sure uh, the colonel made himself something of a minor celebrity right years before as we went over when he grew up the mustache the goatee adopted the all white outfits but he still hadn't fully exploited his promotional possibilities Brown felt that the possession of a symbol who was both authentic and alive unlike Betty Crocker for instance was one of the company's greatest assets so he hires a big public uh, relations firm big PR firm in Manhattan and the colonel now starts popping up on the Tonight Show the Merv Griffin Show other network programs where he holds his own, right? The Colonel fe feared no man and feared, uh, n he did not fear the spotlight either. A uh, second Brown decided that the company must have a vigorous unified advertising campaign, local and national. Third Brown negotiated new contracts with franchisees under the company, uh, under which the company received a percentage of franchisee sales instead of five cents, the going rate for every chicken cooked at this point. Uh, this served to protect the company against inflation also gave it a cut on the sale of such accessory items as salads, beans, delicious little bucket parfaits. Damn you, Sarah Lee. Fucking submit already to the fucking colonel. Uh, finally, very significantly, Brown halted the franchising of existing restaurants, insisted all new outlets be take-home units housed in freestanding buildings and standardized in both appearance and menu. In the new freestanding buildings, Kentucky Fried Chicken as a brand will become more visible to the public uh, a takeout format will suit the increasing number of American housewives who are often in a mood to eat dinner at home without cooking it themselves. The Colonel, due to retaining the right to run his Canadian franchises, he and Claudia uh, buy a second home outside of Toronto and they'll live part-time there until the Colonel passes away in 1980. Uh, he will sadly die in a gunfight. Some motherfucker thought they could advertise their fried chicken restaurant within a mile of one of his franchises in Edmonton, despite him publicly letting his Canadian competition know that he was. Canada's chicken king. And anyone who didn't agree would risk the colonel blowing their goddamn head off. The man the colonel battled, Wilbert Crow, owner proprietor of Crow's hot and tasty bird flesh, bought his or brought his five sons, a true murder of Crow's, to a fight that was supposed to be a one-on-one man-to-man -on -one situation. The colonel took out three of his kids, wounded Wilbert, fighting uh, still, despite taking eight shots to the arms, legs, neck, and torso. But then Wilbert's son, Bilbert Crow, gunned down the colonel, left him for dead on the streets of Edmonton, where they still have a statue today. Or, that was fucking crazy. Or the colonel had been battling leukemia for months and died of pneumonia in the hospital December 16th. Uh, before his death, for much of the last 15 years of his life, he would travel on an, uh, excuse me, an average of 200,000 miles a year, flying, not driving, and often with Claudia, as the KFC brand ambassador. He'll appear in dozens of commercials, countless parades, ribbon cutting ceremonies, festivals, TV shows, and more. And then Sanders was buried in his characteristic white suit 
and a black western string tie in the Cave Hill Cemetery of Louisville. About 1,200 people attended the service. His wife, Claudia, will die 16 years later, December 31st, 1996, at the age of 94. And by the time of Sanders' death, there were an estimated 6,000 KFC outlets in 48 countries worldwide with $2 billion in sales annually. And since his death, numerous comics and actors have portrayed the colonel in dozens of additional commercials, such as Saturday Night Live alums Daryl Hammond and Norm MacDonald, comic Jim Gaffigan, actors George Hamilton, Rob Riggle, Billy Zane, Jason Alexander, Ray Liotta, Rob Lowe, even country singer Reba McIntyre. The Colonel has uh, entered the DC comic universe with three issues in a DC KFC uh, collaboration. The Colonel's likeness has also truly entered the wrestling ring a few times in the WWE. During the 2016 SummerSlam, a promotional ad featured Dolph Ziggler dressed as the Colonel beating up the Miz wearing a chicken suit. Then in 2017, both Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle dressed up as wrestling versions of the Colonel for some ads. Uh, and Sanders was a playable character in WWE 2K18. And there are tons of other Colonel uh, pop culture moments leading up to the present day. Now let me pop out and share a little more info and recap the Colonel before going over the year in review. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. Colonel Sanders, I'm guessing when his name popped up in your podcast feed or when you came across this video on YouTube, you had a little like, is this a joke moment? Tyler thought I was fucking around when you first saw this topic pop up on Dropbox, like KFC, Colonel Sanders. I'll, I'll admit it is a weird choice, but I'm glad I picked it. It's, it's highly unlikely that you're going to waltz through a long life without ever, ever having any major setbacks, right? Without any big failures. And I've heard, as I imagine, you've heard also, you know, some version of it's not your failures that define you, but how you respond to them. And I do think there's a lot of truth in that. Harlan Sanders' life was absolutely defined by how he responded to so many setbacks. Uh, that being said, I am also very aware that you can't successfully respond to any at all adversity that comes your way. I I'm not going to preach that hollow feel good bullshit to you. You know, you actually can't do anything you want. I, I hate those motiv motivational, you know, uh, poster phrases like you can do anything you set your mind to, or you can achieve anything, you know, you put your mind and work hard to No, sounds nice to say things like that means at least to me, absolutely fucking nothing. I if you're born blind, you're never going to become an NBA all-star point guard, no matter how hard you work, no matter how bad you want it. It's never going to happen. If you're born deaf, you're never going to become a big time music producer, guiding, mixing albums for the best selling artists of your day. If you're paralyzed from the neck down, you're never going to dominate your weight class in the UFC. It's fucking ridiculous. And I use those extreme examples to make it perfectly clear that not everything is possible for all of us. And I think it's cruel to tell anyone otherwise and set them up for failure and heartache. There are absolutely limitations to all of our aspirations. There is a difference between admirably chasing dreams and foolishly wasting time chasing pipe dreams. For a less dramatic example, I was never going to be a track and field star. Even if that would have been my dream, no matter how much I would have busted my ass, it was not going to happen. I was never the fastest kid on the playground. Uh, even if I would have had the best coaches in the world training me on perfecting my stride, uh, getting my workout and diet you know, perfect to maximize my body's potential... I just don't see how I, how I would have ever become the fastest dude around. I don't have the right genetics for that. And I could spend hours talking about all the other things it would be impossible for me to accomplish. And everybody listening, there are limitations for you as well. There are things outside your control you simply cannot overcome. But also, I think we do have the ability to dramatically improve our lives in many ways if we just keep getting back up. When life knocks us down, right? To the best of our ability. If we keep trying, if we keep refusing to give up in rational ways, right? You know, if you, and if you push really hard to become a CEO, maybe you won't become a CEO, but maybe you will reach the levels of upper management. And, you know, you got further than you would have if you wouldn't have tried to go further than that. You know, I do like that saying, shoot for the stars, aim for the moon, which can be interpreted as suggesting that if you fail to achieve your goals, you will still be better than where you were before you were, you know, before thanks to trying to achieve them. I think our lives are largely defined by how we respond to adversity. You know, how easy is it for life to knock you off your path? How difficult do you make it for life to knock you off your path? 
Responding to setbacks with tenacity, grit, perseverance to adversity might not help tell the story of your life, uh, you know, that ends up with you becoming some sort of luminary in your field. Your life story might not end up reaching the late in life, dramatic against all odds success of the kernels, but getting back up when you get knocked down will for sure take your life to greater heights than just laying down and accepting defeat. Think about how many times Harlan could have just given up when he blew his chance at a career as a lawyer by literally beating up a client in front of a judge. After studying at night for years to get enough education to be a lawyer, then he had to take his wife and kids, move back in with his mom, get another labor job, working for the railroad to barely provide for them. That setback could have easily led to him not wanting to take any big swings again. And I'm not talking about the haymaker. He probably threw at that client. He could have easily just settled for a life working the railroad, even though he clearly didn't love it. Just kept his head down, worked, not bothered with going through the growing pains that come with switching up professions because change is hard. It is stressful which is why so many avoid it. But Harlan didn't. He kept embracing change, kept taking chances. Like when he, you know, took all that money he made on his big ferry venture, quickly lost it on a gambling or on a gamble, excuse me, making lamps. That could have left a such a sour taste in his mouth that he would have been too scared to ever bet the farm on some big entrepreneurial idea like that again. But he kept swinging, right? He kept running into dead ends and then kept on pushing past them. Think about when he lost his job selling tires shortly after that. And got in a car wreck. Now he's hitchhiking around, looking for a new job. You know, if if he would have had some woe is me, fucking the world's against me attitude, what do you do? you do? I just can't win. Do you think that when he was picked up by the general manager for Standard Oil of Kentucky, that dude would have still offered him a job running a gas station? Oh, fuck no. Right? You don't get a job like that out of pity from a stranger. You get it because you have the balls to really sell yourself. He got it because he kept his head up, kept believing in himself even when he was down. He jumped into an entirely new profession, again, fought his way literally at times in that job to success. And because he busted his ass and made a bit of a name for himself, when the Great Depression quickly then took that job away from him, he got another chance with another station. Instead of feeling sorry for himself, leaning into all of his losses, he clearly still had hope that this next time, things are going to be different, right? Things are going to work out better this next time. He busted his ass again. Maybe took shit a bit too far when he got into a gunfight with another gas station owner or who knows maybe that guy was a real bully and that's what he just had to do to survive during the dog eat dog years of the depression over the next few decades he'll take shots on motels restaurants other businesses he'll lose he'll win then when he's 65 after you know so many failures and a bunch of success as well after working his ass off since around the age of five thinking he was finally set he gets knocked down by life again right the business he bet his retirement on gets taken out from him right? Taken away from him by the upcoming arrival of the interstate. He could have easily quit at that point, right? Just said, fuck it. Lived modestly on his social security checks, some small kickbacks from a few restaurants, buying that blend of herbs and spices that he and his wife would whip up at home. And who would blame him? And if that was enough for him, then more power to him. But he didn't just want that. He, he didn't feel that was enough. It wasn't going to give him and his wife the life they wanted. So he responded to that setback by fighting yet again, by getting back up again and continuing to try. He spent money he didn't really have driving around the country in his Cadillac, sleeping in the back seat, selling his pressure cooked fried chicken all around the U.S. and Canada. He gambled on himself again, and it finally worked for the long run. The boy born a dirt poor farmer who had to start acting a lot more like an adult than almost anyone listening to this, I imagine, when he was just five years old when his dad died. He fought for what he wanted his whole life and finally achieved true lasting financial security in his late 60s. Harlan didn't build a fast food empire because he was lucky, because life was easy for him, because it wasn't. He built it by refusing to give up, and I do respect that so much. So going into 2024, what do you want to accomplish, right? What adversity, if any, are you going to respond to? What goals feel somewhat realistic to accomplish? What goals suit your skills and passion? You know, part of Harlan's success, his secret blend, was how passionate he was about his product. Right? In an article published by the Louisville Courier Journal, Journal on October 8th, 1975, he told journalist Dan Kaufman, my God, that gravy's horrible. They buy tap water for 15 to 20 cents a thousand gallons and they mix it with flour and starch and end up with pure wallpaper paste. And I know wallpaper paste by God because I've seen my mother make it. There's no nutrition in it and they ought not to be allowed to sell it. The crispy fried chicken recipe is nothing in the world but a damn fried dough ball stuck on some chicken. His own company, would sue him for libel for that one. But I love it. He was 85 years old when he said that. He cared that much about his precious chicken. He didn't like when somebody was fucking it up. 
right? It was that passion to do things the right way that I imagine really drove him in life. So what are you passionate about? How hard are you willing to work to realize the dream of whatever it is you're passionate about? And it doesn't have to be dominating some field, by the way. Uh, Don't feel forced to dream big, truly. Don't give into that weird second places for losers bullshit mentality. If your dream is to have a steady nine to five with good benefits, a pension, you don't don't really love it, but it allows you to not work in your 70s and it allows you to spend nights and weekends not thinking about work and doing other things you do love. That's awesome. If your dream is to make it all or, or make it to all, excuse me, or almost all of your kids' basketball games because you know you want them to remember you cheering for them later for the rest of their lives, that's a great dream. If your dream is to rescue a few dogs from a shelter, give them amazing lives, awesome. If your dream is to be the rock your partner needs to lean on and be known amongst your friends as somebody who shows up for them when they're at their lowest, I love it. Whatever the fuck your dream is, when you hit some setbacks, and you probably will because, you know, well, life, I hope stories like Harlan's pop up in your mind and help you along your path. That was the main reason I wanted to share his story with you. And, And also, you know, I was drawn to it. I needed to hear it too. I need to hear a story of somebody who makes it, then loses it, then makes it again, then loses it, then makes it. Somebody who refuses to give up on their dreams. Uh, I spread myself a bit too thin, way too thin at times these past seven years, uh, chased my own dreams on my own journey, and I kind of lost my mind a bit behind the scenes this fall. (laughs) And I was worried that I kind of fried my engine, fucked myself for a little bit. You know, 46 years old, I was suddenly feeling very old and worn out beyond that number. Like maybe the amount of grit and determination I'd always felt I had was was not going to reach the same levels that it used to anymore because I broke something. My response to some exhaustion, to some true, did I just fucking ruin something in my head, level of burnout, was to cancel a big 50-city stand-up theater tour that I've been working towards for a long time and to let go of uh, The Secret Suck, which I've loved, the weekly show for the patrons that allowed all this to work. Those moves can look like the moves of somebody on their way out of the entertainment business. And it did feel like that to me in some moments, right? Both moves, scary as hell. But I don't think I'm about done with this business. Uh, In addition to just getting some needed rest and recharging, I did what I did, uh, you know, because just like Harland, I do care about my product, right? I I don't want my word gravy to taste like wallpaper paste. It it is a privilege to be able to do this professionally, and I do not take that for granted. Bad Magic has become my Kentucky Fried Chicken, my baby, and I want to protect it, right? I love stand-up. I love the secret suck. But right now, I do love Time Suck more. Uh, Because without Time Suck, there would be no stand-up theater tour. There would be no Secret Suck. This is what everything else for me is built on. It's the engine that's driven everything I've worked on for a while now. You know, my life changed a lot these last seven years. And that started with this podcast, with these weekly episodes and you listening to them. And I've not lost sight of that. They would not be scared to death without Time Suck. And without Time Suck and Scared to Death, there would be no big monthly charity donations, no bad magic giving tree contributions. We wouldn't be able to employ the cool people that we do, the great team that we have. And all of that matters to me a lot. But also I did, you know, uh, or excuse me, I need to believe that if all of this did go away, I could build something, something else, right? I need to instill that type of confidence in myself. Because if I believe that and I keep working on this podcast because I love it and don't feel like I need it, like that I'm not desperate about it, well, it'll be that much better, right? I won't squeeze the fucking life out of it, out of desperation. I bet Harland had, uh, you know, that kind of inner confidence. That's so important. Give your current project and current dream your all, but also believe in yourself enough to think that if that dream dies, you do have the grit that's nasty to build something else, to start again. So that was, uh, you know, also why I chose to tell Harland's story. Uh, I, I hope that I can take some of his energy, right? All the way to the end of 2024. And now I think I've fully segued into the year-end wrap-up and look-ahead portion of this episode. Uh, after just starting to get a taste of having a, a bit less on my plate and feeling more rested, even though I, you know, I have a little cold right now, obviously, uh, I, I, I can tell that the episodes, you know, they just feel a little better. And I've gotten, you know, feedback from a lot of you that the episodes the last month or so, just there's something different about them. It feels better, which is important in an increasingly competitive podcast landscape. I'm looking forward to living a more well-balanced and thus happier life and then being able to present more well-balanced, happier uh, content, right? Week after week. I'm taking this recharge seriously. I'll be meeting with a creative consultant, uh, somebody who specializes in bouncing back from and preventing burnout in the first quarter of 2024, to try and become the best version of myself, both in work and in life that I can be. I'll be starting a new workout plan with a friend and trainer to get in better shape uh, physically because I feel better physically. My mind is sharper. I'll be meeting with my uh, stepsister who's a 
dietitian or maybe nutritionist. <laughs> Emily's a smart food person of some sort uh, to get healthier, think clear, have more energy throughout the day. Key for kicking out weekly weird, well research, you know, well researched papers. Uh, okay. Before talking more specifically a bit about what I hope is going to come next year and beyond, let's take a little trip down memory lane. This was so fun for me. I hope it's fun for you. Uh, look at some fun stuff that happened here in 2023. Uh, my favorite next part of the section is the episode. But first, uh, I want to thank a bunch of you for coming to, you know, support a big stand up bucket list box I got to check off. The Burn It All Down Theater Tour was so much fun. I got to headline my own theater tour and enough of you came out to sell out almost every show. Spokane, Boise, Sacramento, Denver, Philly, San Antonio, Dallas, Kansas City, St. Louis, Seattle, Pontiac, Michigan. Oh man. Uh, Indianapolis, Columbus, Ohio. So many good memories I will treasure for the rest of my life. So many cool venues and fun shows. It was actually supposed to be a, a trial tour to get a bigger tour later. And, and I did get that bigger tour offered, which, you know, I said I postponed. Uh, indefinitely for the time being, but you know, so, still cool to get it. And also uh, cool for the support Outback Presents showed me and not penalizing me for postponing dates and being incredibly kind about the whole thing. Uh, giving me an open door to pick up dates with them in the future of Brian Dorfman, best concert promoter in all of comedy. Uh, he owns Zanies in Nashville, one of my favorite clubs. If you're in the Nashville area, go to that club. Not only are you going to see a great show, you're going to be taken care of by a well-trained staff. You're supporting one of the best dudes in comedy. And his brother, Andrew Dorfman, might be an even better guy. No knock on you, Brian. But your brother's a fucking angel of a human being. I love those guys. Uh, the theater shows I did in the club, uh, you know, shows where I was supposed to be preparing material for a new hour. Also a great reminder of how important Time Suck has been to everything else. When I've tossed out Hail Nimrods to start these shows, it feels like 90% of the audience says it back. You know, people, these shows, they're not, you know, really yelling out old stand-up bits for me to do. They're yelling out references from Time Suck consistently. I noticed that, you know, and it factored into me making sure that I don't get so burned out that I fuck this show up. Uh, the next super cool thing career-wise this past year was the release of the special, Trying to Get Better on YouTube. So many of you have watched it. It uh, came out back at the end of August, has over 720,000 views as I record this. Uh, my goal was a million views in the first year of release, and it feels pretty possible if not you know very likely that that's going to happen now and the comment section underneath the video 90 percent of the comments again are time suck references if i was looking for signs of where i should put most of my creative energy in 2024 i could not get more indications to focus on time suck speaking of time suck let's go over the episodes before i talk about wet hot bad magic summer camp and more First episode of the year was 329 Dungeons and Dragons. What a fun one. We announced the tickets going on sale for the second annual Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp. That episode, uh, out of Dungeons and Dragons, came the Suckverse generic action figure toy line, starting with Fighting Man. Oh. Fighting Man, Fighting Man, I am a Fighting Man. Watch out for my melee sword. This is my defense shield. Goblin Troll, Elf Wizard, fight, 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 fight. And I know that's not the original music I used. Uh, I was grabbing music quickly right before I recorded that episode originally. Bouncing from track to track, find a, trying to find the right vibe. I thought the tracks I was looking at, most of them were uh, royalty free, but then whoops, grabbed the wrong one at the last second. Sorry, 8-Bit Universe. Uh, thank you, though, for being so cool to let us keep the original track for the first episode. Uh, Pootie and Juju also made a little cameo first in a long time in that episode. Too little, too diddle, Pootie. Next, we covered Amanda Knox. I assumed, like, uh, you know, with Casey Anthony, that she'd gotten away with murder. Or at least kind of gotten away with it. Since, you know, she went to prison for a few years. All, a lot of the press made her look so guilty. But no, uh, railroaded by a very corrupt Italian judicial system. And I loved being surprised by that. Uh, that episode was when I finally let all of you know that I am, in fact, fluent in Italian. A ciao bella, eh, San Antonio Reggaeton Ferrari, eh, su Gucci Maserati Pizzeria, a spicy meatball, a mamma mia, I knew it was you, Fredo. Masterclass. Next, we traveled back in time to the days of Julius Caesar. And it was there that we met Derek Skeet Skeet Mullet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hog focus, dog focus. Damn it. It's tough to say. Also, <laughs> Easier to say, that was where all the hot, hard father-daddy talk started. Did you have any idea you were going to get so much hot, hunky father-daddy action to start 2023? So many daddies, the daddies of your dreams, call 1-900-HOT-DADDY 
to talk to real nude rock hard father daddies today. Next was the trash bag killer, Patrick Kearney, uh, where he heard about a new AD and D realm or a campaign, excuse me, called Nimrod's realm. That pile of shit still alive on death row at the age of 84, uh, still won't confess to the murders he's committed. Then to start February, we learned about the Sylvanians, a sex cult based in therapy. That was a new twist. Uh, we drank some therapy Whipple in that suck and learned that Antonio Banderas, who I know is Spanish, opened up Antonio Banderas, hot, hot, father, daddy's Italian beast on male strip club. Next, we went historical again. Learned all about China's Tiananmen Square massacre and protests. Nice little reminder not to take free speech for granted. Another reminder of how horrific and oppressive China's government can be. Then we mixed up history and true crime with the Leopold and Loeb, perfect murder suck, where we learned all about the Ubermensch and where we were reminded how dangerous gin and jazz really are. If you're listening to jazz while drinking gin, you might as well just straight up sell your soul to Satan. Don't fuck around, wind up with some dementia jazz mania. Following that true crime caper, we stayed historical with the incredible tale of the Night Witches. That's one of my favorite episodes. Hail Lucifina. The tale of some brave Russian women bombing the shit out of some Nazis in World War II with some shitty equipment. Rest in peace, Marina Raskova, all the other brave bomber and fighter pilots whose courageous actions we discussed. Women who proved themselves as every bit as fearless and formidable as their male military counterparts. Next, we went over the largest private theft in American history, the biggest art heist in modern world history, the $600 million Gardner Museum robbery. Still haven't recovered that stolen artwork. Still so many suspects, basically all of them dead. Who knows if the art will ever turn up? We then jumped into March with the Three Mile Island nuclear disaster where we learned that nuclear energy, actually pretty safe, maybe our best bet for clean, reliable energy. And more importantly, we met another member of the action hero people set, Atomic Man. Who from the makers of Fighting Man, Flying Guy, Warrior Woman, and Attack Cat, it's Atomic Man. Atomic Man is from the future. Atomic Man has a laser gun and X-ray vision. Atomic Man can shrink himself. Atomic Man can big himself. He can melt your face with radiation gas. Yes, his gas is radioactive. And he carries nuclear weapons in his Atomic Man fanny pack. I said nukes. Nukes in his fanny pack. I said nukes. Nukes in his fanny pack. Feel the future with Atomic Man. Be the future with Atomic Man. Ah, it's hard to go back in. All these, all these fucking songs, all these melodies. Uh, but yeah, it was pretty cool. And then back to some true crime. After that, with the quasi culty episode of The Death Angels, we learned all about uh, Yakub, the Nation of Islam's twisted racist teachings that led to a group of guys in the Bay Area thinking they're killing a bunch of white devils a.k.a. just random innocent white people, was going to help bring in about an era of black supremacy. Uh, it did not. Black supremacy, white supremacy, all the supremacy talk, just a bunch of anti-team meat sack bullshit. Uh, next, we dug into some full evil secret society Illuminati shit by exposing the Skull and Bone Society for who they really are. Uh, some rich kids making themselves feel extra important by sharing secret handshakes and rituals and doing a lot of networking with other rich kids to help ensure that they make more fuckloads of family money after graduation. It was fun to bring back the Idiot to the Internet segment with that one, right? Hadn't hit that button in a while. Idiots of the Internet. 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 Then we got into a big two-parter, the last two-parter we've done. Uh, the second part just, you know, sadly never gets enough downloads to justify continuing with two-parters, I'm afraid, but who knows? Maybe I'll try one again someday. Uh, not all of you agreed that we should have spent two weeks on the Kirtland killings and Jeffrey Lundgren, but damn it, there was just so many juicy details to his insane story, right? We've covered a lot of people giving up everything to go live on some cult compound, but we had not covered anyone who agreed to go live in the woods with her husband and cult leader and be shit on by them. Oh, skid mark. Sad, sad skid mark. Uh, Lundgren, such a low rent cult leader, right? Fleece and his followers so he could occasionally go eat some cheddar biscuits at Red Lobster. And still, some people thought he was God's most powerful prophet. The dude who watched Rambo to prepare for a, a heavenly military siege. Nothing is over! Nothing! You just don't turn it off! Also, we added Prophet Jeffrey 
to our Action Hero People set. So, so that was pretty fun. I mean, maybe my favorite member of the Action Hero People team. Do you want to get pooped on? Yeah, you want to get pooped on. Do you want to get pooped on? Yeah, you want to get pooped on. But you don't want to pay too much for a name. Brand Profit. Save your money and buy Profit Jeffrey for half the price he can shit on your tits. Do you want to get pooped on? Come on, that was a pretty fun one. That's the easier one to, uh, to jump back into. It's got a better melody. I'm pretty proud of that song. Following Lundgren and Skidmark's sad but very entertaining tale, we went over some of New York City's rough and rugged early days, looked at how decades of corruption, anti-Irish immigration sentiment helped lead to the rise of the so-called Irish mob. Uh, I still cringe when I think about the type of hand-to-hand combat some of those tough old Irish gangsters engaged in, right? During the early, excuse me, early days of Manhattan's long run with organized crime. Fucking brick bats. Just tossing a brick into a sock and swinging that shit as hard as you could into somebody's face. Just smashing someone's face back in the days before cosmetic surgery. I bet some dudes walking around five points that had some hardcore facial disfigurements. Uh, also, my favorite edition of Whipple might be the Irish mob edition. Uh, from there, we covered the Bible Belt Strangler. I'm still wondering if my dad was behind those redhead murders, right? Dad watch, so important. We learned how many unsolved murders there uh, are often, you know, or in that episode. Back in the 80s, the FBI believed there was over 750 U.S. highway murder victims alone just in the U.S. Murders where no one had been arrested. From there, we met Mr. Terry Blair and again asked ourselves, are some people just born evil? The prospect killer born into a family tree of so much fucking murder, right? Growing up around Kansas City's Prospect Avenue certainly did not help push Terry away from a life of crime. But this guy, man, his mom killed his stepdad. Six months later, his brother killed somebody in a robbery. Then not long after that, killed another person. Then his sister helped kill a man, then killed someone else a decade later. Another brother of his sexually assaulted a woman and beat her so badly he thought she was dead. And more of his close relatives also would go to prison for various sexual assaults, murders, and other serious crimes. Most murderous family I think we've come across. No wonder Terry is still able to speak so casually about his own murders today from prison. We also met Suck First lawyer Rooster Bogle in that episode, the man who told his kids essentially that they were cock-a-doodle-doomed. We then exploded into May with the story of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, learned all kinds of volcano-related information like how Angelina Jolie has an uncle, Barry Voigt, who was a respected geologist who looked at how dangerous Mount St. Helens was before it erupted. Did not know a volcanologist was a real job before that episode. And none of us knew about the science of massive eruption boners before that episode because I made that up in that episode. When I think of that episode, I I think about Harry Truman, who died on the mountain, how his death seemed fitting, right? He loved that mountain, had already lived a long, healthy life to the age of 83. And I think he was glad to die there rather than leave the only home he ever cared about and wither away. Next, we return to the world of true crime with the story of Martha Beck and Raymond Fernandez, the Lonely Hearts Killers, dating match made in hell. My favorite part of that episode had nothing to do with Ray and Martha and everything to do with some early 20th century Russians uh, trying to find, you know, marriage by posting ads in marriage newspaper, Braknaya Gazeta, between 1906 and 1917. You remember the guy who wanted to marry a rich lady who would support his music and he didn't care how old she was? Young, very handsome, intelligent, Georgian teacher, tall, a healthy, strong musician specialized in violin, want to marry a rich lady who would give him an opportunity to finish musical education. Age does not matter. Or the rich lady who desperately wanted some deep decking. <laughs> very interesting lady, blonde with dark eyes, with capital, want to get married only to man who has at least one feature, but a well-endowed one. We then return to my favorite category. Cult. Cult cult and learn that long before the counterculture revolution southern california already a cult hotbed when we explored the formation and teachings of the fountain of the world cult krishna venta aka francis francis pensivik uh, aka the prophet who had a real problem paying child support the man who taught us all about the power of the holy holy bible hello true seeker Greetings, worshipper. The blessings and glory, I hope thy heart is full. You are no doubt familiar with the Holy Bible, and perhaps also with its teachings. 
But are you familiar with the Holy Bible? Perhaps you've prayed to God. But have you prayed to God? Only in the Holy Bible will you find the true word of God. Sounds pretty fun. Uh, next up, maybe the least listened to episode of the year, but one I personally found fascinating in its examination of how U.S. imperialism, uh, you know, uh, really fucked up over or really fucked over much of Latin America. Also, some big produce conglomerates could make a whole bunch of fruit money. The 1928 Banana Massacre, not the 1994 Banana Massacre that I took part of in a grocery store bathroom. In this episode, we discuss how connected the global economy is, how hard it remains to this day to enjoy low-cost goods in this country that don't come at the direct expense of exploiting the fuck out of other meat sacks and other nations. We then finished out May with more true crime, the brutal story of the Hillside Stranglers. Right, That story was where I came across the words store detective, words that gave birth to the suck versus very own store detective, Sonny Hollister. Detective Sonny Hollister here meets X. Thanks for letting me explain how I'd solve all these crimes faster than you can say bang, bang, chicken and shrimp. Until next time, you keep listening to true crime and I'll keep stopping it. Stay sunny, everyone. Following the Hillside Stranglers was a story of Brian Wells, the pizza bomber. I love a weird story, and this story was super weird. Uh, poor Brian was not working with a lot upstairs, was really taken advantage of by a strange, sad, terrible group of misfits used as a weird pawn in the most ridiculous and convoluted bank robbery scheme I've ever heard of. And then there was R. Kelly, Mr. Piss on You himself. I don't think we've ever had an episode that downloaded faster in the few weeks, uh, first few weeks of release. Uh, what a predatory dirtbag, fucking around with teen girls, sexually abusing teen girls for so, so long, doing it blatantly and in the public eye, making sex tapes, not seeming to care. They were getting leaked and spread around, making off or paying off parents, picking up teen girls at McDonald's, doing that shit in front of everyone like he was above the law. And it seemed like he was until finally he wasn't. Some brave women refused to have their stories remain silenced. And now he will die where he deserves to prison. I uh, can't believe some people still try and defend that sadistic, pissed on teens pedophile. Well, I guess I can't believe it. I mean, the world's never been short on ignorant people. And then an episode that really pissed off a lot of people, the Crusades. I'll be honest. I was a bit surprised by the backlash. Backlash. Uh, I shared the facts like I do in all the episodes. And I shared anger over meat sacks being abused, murdered, and exploited like I always try and do. But because the culprit this time was organized religion, specifically Christianity, Suddenly to many suckers, I was a hate-mongering asshole. All fun and games until the laser gets pointed at a set of beliefs that you hold near and dear, right? Mock a crazy cult for acting in abusive and inhuman ways. Almost everyone's on board because, well, almost everyone is not in that cult. Apply that same perspective to a huge belief system and now it feels personal, which I do understand. That episode and a few others, good reminders for me. Sometimes if I, as the messenger, don't want to get shot... I need to take more time and think about how I present my points. Try to deliver them with a bit more honey and a little less vinegar. And then the last episode for the first half of the year was a reminder about how you just can't rehabilitate sexual predators. Some lines when crossed, I do think change people in ways that cannot be unchanged. And Vienna's Jack Unterweger crossed those lines in Europe before he was released from prison and then went on a brutal rape and killing spree here in the US. And then, oh boy, another episode they got me in a lot of trouble. Ban the witch! The witchcraft suck, 355. Thousands and thousands of people have been killed for being thought to be witches. Was a single one of them ever killed for actually having dark powers? Or were they all killed over either religious paranoia or by conniving motherfuckers using religious paranoia to justify having someone killed so they then could take their property or for some other very much of this world reason? Since no witch has ever sorcerered their way out of a hangman's noose, or away from a fire lit to destroy them, I'm going to say all witches have died needlessly. Uh, will we ever evolve to stop fearing the outsider, the other? You know what, today? I think we will. As superstitious as we still are, we are far less superstitious than we used to be. There's been a lot of progress we can feel good about. Uh, also, we got another action hero people uh, set figure in that suck. Old witch lady with her magic potion gravy. Uh, following a few touchy episodes, we return to a topic almost no one ever seems threatened by. Serial killers. Uh, we looked into the deranged mind of Jerry Brudos, the shoe fetish slayer, where we learned that maybe 
If your little boy wants to toss on some high heels and prance around the house, maybe don't go off on him and burn the shoes unless you want him to become a sexually motivated slayer. Remember Jer Bear's crazy ass plan? He wanted to find some place where he could set up what he would call an underground butcher shop with a bunch of cells where he'd keep women captive and there would be a huge freezer room where he would freeze the bodies of women he had to kill for not doing what he wanted or women he grew tired of. And to find women to fill this place up, he would literally take a bus and drive around, you know, like the Portland area, round up these women, bring them back to his torture complex. He'd get them all set up in their cages. Then he would choose which ones he wanted to, you know, use for his pleasure. He would take them out, rape them, maybe also shoot them, stab them, beat them, torture them sexually, and no one would be the wiser. Oh, and he'd take a bunch of pictures of them for his horror, fo- horror photo collection. And when he's finally done with them, he would, you know, take them to his freeze room and freeze them in the position that he found the sexiest. So they would stay in that position to arouse him forever. Like he actually thought all of that was a plausible plan. Luckily, it wasn't. He got caught, thankfully, and then he died in prison. Following that idiot, uh, a bunch of follow-up, a bit of follow-up, excuse me, to the Irish mob episode with the story of Whitey Bulger. So many fucking nicknames. Uh, Tony Salami Legs McNeil, Jimmy Jazz Hands O'Reilly, Mickey Shepherd's Pie with a little too much butter on the potatoes, Kill Kenny, Larry Brickbag McSweeney, Johnny Pork Chops, Fat Donnie, Greased Weasel Tails Quinn, Frankie makes a better pork chop than Johnny Pork Chops McMurphy. Willie Animal Crackers McGregor. Barry, don't let him kick your uncle Orion. Skinny Vinny, regular size Patty. Tiny Tommy, not quite tiny, but I have a hard time justifying calling him a normal size guy, Gary Walsh. Denny Encyclopedias and Shit Flynn. Jackie Googles the shit out of Shit O'Connor. Fat Kenny Moore, even fatter Mikey Wallace. Holy shit, we gotta get you on a slim fast, you fat fuck Dicky Duffy. Too skinny Tony Cunningham. Seriously, eat a fucking sandwich already, Randy McMahon. Lenny Pork Cutlets Malone, and Jumpin' Jimmy James, Johnny Jamie Juniper Jackknife Johnson. I may have made up those nicknames, but they were inspired by so many real nicknames I found ridiculous. Uh, Next, we spent uh, some time talking about how safe flying is, ironically, in the episode about the mysterious disappearance of Malaysia Flight 370. Uh, Spoiler alert, if you skip that one, it crashed into the fucking ocean. Also, we met the legendary Dick Quest, and that suck. The CNN correspondent who was arrested in New York City Central Park at 3.40 in the morning with some meth in his pocket, a rope around his neck connected to his cock and balls, and a sex toy in his boot. Meth, you never disappoint. Then we finished out July with some Shakespeare. We learned so much about the bard, like how hard it must have been to be a playwright and an actor when it was common for people to literally take a piss and or shit in the audience during performances. And people would actually throw stuff at the actors on stage, or even walk on stage and disrupt the play. And theaters were regularly shut down over outbreaks of the plague. What a time to be alive. Uh, We also met the most prolific serial killer the world had never heard of. Billy Shakes. A monster killing women between London, Stratford-upon-Avon, and then skinning the flesh from their hands in order to make macabre gloves. Much ado about... The Satan. Following some silliness with Shakespeare, we got serious with the sad but very important story of Emmett Till. I uh, got some negative feedback from a few idiots over that one. Uh, good riddance. Apparently, uh, some read, uh, you know, uh, me as being woke uh, because they're fragile, small minded, easily shook people uh, who just don't like to hear real history involving white people not looking good in America. Uh, I think it's important not to forget the sins of our past in hopes that we, it'll reduce how frequently we repeat them. Right. Important to remember that it wasn't so long ago that right here in America, a young black man, a black child could be murdered for daring to touch a white woman's hand when he's handing money to a cashier and then cat calling at her when she leaves her store. Following week, we got weird again with the tale of the UK's Jeffrey Dahmer, Dennis Nielsen. I still laugh when I think about that weird, creepy fuck pretending to pass out in front of people in the hopes that they would truly think he was unconscious and then would take the next step, a, a big step of molesting him. Do you remember my Scottish, but really not Scottish at all, maybe kind of Australian, maybe just kind of its own thing, accent for Dennis, it's the exact same accent as Billy Shakes? Oh no, oh no, please don't take my pants off. Please don't take off my pants, but really uh, take them off. Stick your hard penis in my butthole after lubing it up all nice and good, then hammer away while I moan and then it come in my sleep because I would still be asleep for all of that. And I would never know you did it and it would be our secret. And I'll never tell a soul and you can do whatever you want. I can be sound asleep whenever you want to plunder my treasure. We then took a big left turn following that. Sud got political with the story of Watergate, the scandal that destroyed faith in American politics. 
Nixon, actually, I begrudgingly admit it, did some really good things during his political career, but also, uh, damn, he took shit too far when it came to attacking his political enemies. Remember how two of his White House plumber cronies considered trying to assassinate a journalist critical of Nixon, Jack Anderson, by rubbing down his steering wheel with LSD, hoping he'd trip to the point of driving off the road and dying in a crash? What the fuck? After Watergate, we had a big episode about a cult that, to my knowledge, no one else has done a big episode about. Nattlefed. The National Labor Federation. That was a great find, Sophie Evans. Re- you remember uh, Eugenio Parente, a.k.a. Jerry, Jerry D., the man who quoted Fidel Castro and uh, Che Guevara as he abused people who originally thought they were just volunteering for one of many different organizations tied to labor unions. Then he sexually exploited some, took the money of many, all under the guise of preparing for a communist takeover of the United States. But then, when the revolution was almost upon us, brothers... When the capitalist pig feds raided his New York City compound. That's the little bitch threw himself down the dumbwaiter shaft and broke his fucking leg. Following that wild story, we toned things down a bit and we talked about libraries. Suck 364, the mystery of the great library of Alexandria. So many scrolls. So many emails float in from Meatsack sharing stories of how important libraries are and why we must continue to fund them. Also, we learned in that episode's Idiots of the Internet that some people uh, think incredible knowledge that used to be stored in the ancient library of Alexandria has been lost forever. Like spells on how to shoot fireballs. Uh, user or YouTuber Richie Appel posted, the library of Alexandria also housed the knowledge of magic that we use to be able to perform. Uh, things you see in medieval fantasy, such as the magic in Skyrim, used to be real. If the library of Alexandria had never burned down, we could be casting spells, throwing fireballs, teleporting, levitating objects, etc. So... Many wizard fireball comments now under my stand-up special on YouTube. And I love it so much. Uh, thanks to anybody who left one of those. Following that Off the Beaten Path episode, we return to the staple of serial killing with the story of David Carpenter, the trailside killer, the wannabe seller of adult novelty keychains. I brought back Captain Whiskerhorn to help David move those keychains. hi all sarsaparilla, away! Like Jack Unterweger, Carpenter showed violent tendencies long before his final killing spree. Should have never been released from prison for previously uh, committed sexual crimes. Next up, another atypical subject. One of my favorite episodes we have ever done. Suck 366, Black Holes and the Nature of the Universe. The singularity, the center of a black hole, the theoretical point in space which has zero volume but contains all of the object's mass. A point inside the event horizon. A place where nothing, not even light, can escape a black hole's clutches. A place where matter is compressed down to an infinitely tiny point and all conceptions of time and space completely break down. A place outside of space and time. Still think about that, right? So fucking mind-bending, so magical. A place to me that helps bridge the gap between science and the potential existence of a divine creator, a god. I did not expect that to be the most spiritual episode for me so far. Looking up the stars into the heavens, so to speak, right? It's always felt magical, uh, but it's felt more so ever since that episode. And I could get lost reflecting on that episode. Uh, Time to move on to a not-so-magical suck. The Bloody Briley Brothers. So glad I was born into a family where my older brothers were were not Linwood and James, right? Siblings even their parents feared. Mom bounced, dad started padlocking his door shut at night from the inside. More than just a serial killer episode, it also featured a crazy prison escape, Linwood and James orchestrating the largest death row escape in U.S. history. Good thing those guys were too cocky to stay hidden once they escaped. Had they snuck out of the country, instead of, uh, you know, going to Philly to live with their uncle, they might not have been caught until they inevitably would have started killing again. Following that was the Korean War, first shots fired of the Cold War, that led to so many other topics we've covered. A crazy, bloody, major war that due to being sandwiched between World War II and Vietnam has never gotten the historical attention it deserves despite the ongoing efforts of John Bon Jovi to bring attention to the war through his many, many hit songs, all of which were written about that conflict. I'm going down in a blaze of glory. Lord, I never drew first, but I drew first blood. I'm no one's son. Call me Young Gun. One of many Bon Jovi classics. Uh, Next up was Larry Hall. Probable serial killer, definite creepy-ass gravedigger who got way into, uh, uh, way too into Civil War reenactments. Uh, Definitely a guy who I wish wrote a lot of Civil War style letters from prison uh, to a lady that he, he does not have. 
August 27th, 1863. My dearest Clarabelle, I, I find my spirit low and my body overtaken with rage today. I'd hope to write you as, as a general, General Burnside. But alas, I remain Lawrence. Am I still very sexy? Yes, I, I'm still extremely cool, of course. But I'm also still but a colonel. I fear I've grown my mutton chops for naught. I do, however, continue to wake up only to dry linen, so that's very nice. I'm a good boy who goes pee-pee in the potty. Please pass along that information to mother and father. Following Lair Bear, we looked into some communist revolutionaries. Right? Old, old Jerry D dreamed of emulating in our suck on the Cuban Revolution. How sad for the people of Cuba that they were exploited throughout imperialist intervention or through imperialist intervention and foreign subjugation for so long that handing the country over to a dictator who was one of their own, like Fidel Castro, seemed like a decent idea. And how strange that when he was fighting his revolution to take over Cuba, he didn't actually have or at least publicly reveal his desire to make his nation a communist stronghold. Uh, Bojangles' blood pressure ran pretty high in that episode. Sadly, the revolution in the long run did not make life any better for the average Cuban. Consistent access to electricity, drinkable water, enough food shortages, uh, you know, other basic necessities remain problems for far too many Cuban citizens. I should have said too many food shortages, not enough. Just enough food shortages. Uh, the following week, we took a peek under the banner of heaven to explore the school of the prophets, cult killings. Brenda Lafferty paid such a terrible price in that episode for standing up for herself, her daughter, sister-in-laws, and refusing to accept the twisted religious teachings and personal revelations of her two fucking insane brother-in-laws, Ron and Dan Lafferty, who had convinced themselves they were preparing God's chosen people for the apocalyptic return of God on earth. The concept of continuous personal celestial revelation, it has led unsurprisingly to so many people mistakenly believing that they are communicating directly with the Almighty and ruining not just their own lives, but ruining and or ending other lives in the process. Uh, that episode is also where I began to reveal uh, my frustration uh, with my wife, Lindsay, who constantly refuses to submit to my righteous patriarchal authority. Next, we finished October with a medieval suck, a little blend of history and true crime, uh, with a look into the possible crimes and life of Gilles de Ray, contemporary of Joan of Arc, maybe very prolific serial killer, the first true serial killer we know of in the modern sense of the term. I can't believe I was still able to record that episode after falling out of bed and landing on my boner that week and bending it to a perfect 90 degree angle. That fucking hurt. And it ruined my sex life for a while. Uh, we met a demon, a demon named Baron that week, a demon I've called Barry ever since. Barry the demon. Sounds friendly. Sounds like a demon who gets your soul because, you know, you fuck up and think he's really nice. How evil could Barry be? Following the possible witch hunt of the trial of Gilles de Ray, or maybe he really was a raper and mutilator of children, we explored Chicago's Tylenol murders. On September 29th, 1982, seven people in the Chicago area died shortly after ingesting Tylenol capsules, poisoned with highly lethal potassium cyanide. And millions have been a bit nervous about, you know, being randomly po poisoned by a stranger ever since. Uh, those murders would change the way we package medicine and more in the U.S. forever. Hate that it happened. Hate that no one ever went to prison for those murders. But love that today we have sealed bottles of aspirin and more so we can feel safer regarding the possibility of a murderous maniac tampering with, no, poisoning something we grab off a store shelf, take home, and pop in our mouths. Following that suck, we jumped into what became an unexpected fan favorite for 2023, at least unexpected to me, our suck on the Duggars. I had no idea. There was so much fascination around how wholesome Jim Bob actually is not. Uh, I also didn't realize prior to really looking into them that they were connected to the teachings of Bill Gothard's The Institute and Basic Life Principles, and how those teachings are super fucked up. We learned how evil drumming is in that episode and how women really need to protect their bicycles. I mean, what man is going to be excited to ride your bike if every Tom, Dick, and Harry in town has already taken it for a spin, scratched out the chain guard, and bent the handlebars, crashed into a ditch? Also, if you really care about saving yourselves from marriage, ladies, please stop using tampons. Don't ever fucking put them in. You're supposed to keep, according to the teachings, everything out of your puss until your husband's dick. Uh, the following week was mostly about looking for a little bit of a dead giveaway. Dead giveaway. Dead giveaway. My neighbor got big testicles because we see this dude every day. Every day. We eat ribs. With this dude. But we didn't have a clue that that girl was in our house. She said, please help me get out. Dead giveaway. 
right? The dead giveaway that something terrible is going on in your neighborhood. Oh, Charles Ramsey, please be out there somewhere living a happy life. Also, I hope Amanda Berry, uh, Gina De Jesus, Michelle Knight continue to thrive despite the hell on earth Ariel Castro put them through when he held three girls as his sexual prisoners in his sadistically modified Cleveland home. That episode was intense and I found myself getting more angry at Ariel than I have at various serial killers even though he never murdered those women. Like I was just such a piece of shit. Uh, we finished up November with an episode debunking the protocols of Zion and I gotta say, pleasantly surprised with the lack of shitty emails sent in over that. Uh, I assume there are a ton of crazy anti-Semitic comments under the YouTube video and I'm not gonna check. One old piece of Russian propaganda has done and continues to do so much harm in the way of stoking the fires of anti-Semitism that continue to burn around the world. So sad that so many continue to present the repeatedly and thoroughly debunked protocols as historical truth. Uh, following that suck, we traveled to South Carolina's low country, examined the terrible crimes of Alex Murdoch, but pronounced Alec Murdoch. I get now why there have already been so many docuseries done on that wife and son killing dirtbag former solicitor, the tale of his son's Paul, of his son Paul's drunken boat accident, uh, the murders that have surrounded the family for years. It all has played out like a real life soap opera. Almost caught up now. Just a few weeks back, we jumped into a story set largely right here in Idaho that has also received a lot of press coverage. The sick tale of Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, and all the zombie, light worker, apocalyptic, fringe, FLDS-based bullshit that led to a lot of people around Lori dying. Like her husband, two kids, and guy she was having an affair with his wife. It was nice, though, to get a nice guide from that episode regarding how to evaluate the people around you as being either light workers who go along with you and never talk shit and always help you, or are they demon-infested zombies who thwart your every fucking move? Looking at you, Lindsay. Or should I say Teddy Bar zombie demon? And finally, last week's episode. She doesn't thwart my every, every move. Uh, last week's episode on the incels, uh, as I record this, it just came out. It had already come out um, for the uh, the patrons. And whew, I don't think an episode all year has gotten the uh, the private Facebook groups fucking fired up. A lot of people worried about uh, a take on an episode they hadn't heard yet. <laughs> so I can only imagine, as I'm recording this right now, if there's more uh, outrage and chatter about this this Intel episode or less. Uh, so many new fun terms learned in that one. Chad, Tyrone, Giga Chad, Stacy, Becky, Wrist Selled, Wrist Mog, Skull Mogged, Height Selled. Who could forget all the talk about getting Moose Knuckle Dick Mogged? So glad I have a fuckable wrist size, barely, but still. This low-tier normie Melvin will take it. And at least I have a huge skull. I'll skull mog the shit out of any incel fucks upset with that episode. Uh, uh, also, uh, what a scary bunch of sad clowns. All right, come on, guys. Stop thinking any woman on earth owes you even the time of day. They don't. Wake up. Start realizing that the reason women are not romantically interested in you probably has a lot more to do with your personal choices and how you've taken care of yourself and the outlook you choose to have on the world around you than it does with your wrist or skull size or interpupillary distance. Get the fuck out of here. Get out of your basements and off your computers, right? Go take a dance class or some therapy. Go to the gym. Get on some dating apps. Shut the fuck up with your victim mentality bullshit. And now after covering the colonel, all done with being curious uh, for 2023 here. And I look forward to now seeing what we're going to cover in 2024. Uh, before talking about the year ahead, I do want to talk a bit more about 2023. Starting with summer camp, uh, the 2023 Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp in Equinox, Pennsylvania. Holy shit, was that a blast. Huge thank you, first off, to every Space Lizard, Bad Magician, and Meat Sack who bought a ticket and showed up. Over 500 of you attended, and it was such a memorable time. More memorable for some of you uh, than others. I heard about a few orgies and a pegging party of some sort. <laughs> hey, you know what? Hello, Safina. Uh, I just hope you're safe and that all involved had a great time. Uh, also, did anyone not sneak in some psilocybin mushrooms? But seriously, thanks to all of you who not only showed up, but brought a great attitude, a willingness to accept new people into your friend groups, try and make sure that everybody had a blast. It was such a supportive group of people. Uh, also, thank you to the staff at Camp No Counselors, especially Massey, Hannah, Joey, Aronka, Handsome Tom. Holy shit, you people run a well-oiled machine. Every detail was thought of the food, uh, the sound systems for the karaoke jam, the bands, live scared to death, stand-up show, drag show, everything, the scheduling, the app full of activities. Uh, another big thank you to Black Fip, uh, yeah, Black Fip Productions, Jamie and Elliot screening a preview of the future Bad Magic documentary or docuseries. 
was a little crazy to watch myself uh, wear out on screen over the course, course of several years of footage and to hear people on camera talking about worrying for years that I was working too much. Uh, I, I do think seeing that for sure pushed me towards taking a break from touring. So thank you. I needed to see it. Uh, they are great guys and wonderful filmmakers if you need any filmmaking done, by the way. Also, big thank you to Chad Daniels and Kelsey Cook, comedy's new power couple, for agreeing to attend, be part of our big stand-up comedy jam in the barn. Chad has a new special I've just been waiting to watch before uh, enthusiastically plugging it because I know I'll love it. It's called Mixed Reviews on YouTube right now. Uh, that was one of my favorite stand-up shows ever. Uh, also, in part, to Harry Riley and Doug Mellard, thank you. Two awesome comics, great friends coming out for the show just to hang and have a blast. Thanks to Will XX, his son Diego, fellow artist Lauren for kicking out a bunch of cool cult tattoos, being awesome people. Big thanks to Jason Hall for everything you did as well behind the scenes. Love you, man. Huge thanks to Queen of Bad Magic Lindsay for spearheading it all. After last year's debacle, I was honestly ready to be done with camp. Uh, but Lindsay went full Colonel Sanders and fucking shot somebody at the gas station across the street or wanted to bounce back and do it right. But she really did. She put in a lot of work. I'm so glad that she did. So glad we had that. Uh, we will not be doing summer camp in 2024, uh, you know, recharging this year, but are doing it in 2025. We'll be offering tickets in 2024 to give people more time to save and plan. And we will be doing it in the same location. And here is why. That camp is literally the only camp in the entire country that does exactly what they do. They're the only one that has a giant staff specializing in custom camps that can accommodate over a thousand people. They are building more premier housing options in 2024. So people in 2025 can choose to upgrade to their own private quarters. If staying in more traditional cabins isn't your speed, all the options they have, a badass app with a map of the camp, an itinerary of activities, the ability to sign up for various activities that doesn't exist in other locations. They have a liquor license, can serve alcohol. They have a massive kitchen, can feed hundreds and feed you well at the same time. They can provide an all-inclusive resort-like experience that also is still like a kid's summer camp. It's a very rare thing that they do. I know it'd be nice to bounce back and forth between the East and West Coast, maybe go to the Midwest, but we just can't replicate all that they can do at that camp anywhere else. Uh, I hope it becomes an annual or, or every other year thing for a long time after 2025, but it only will remain if you come. So, you know, you know, be, come be a cult member for a weekend. You'll love it. Uh, next item of business, why I chose to sunset the Time Suck app, which I still need to do. Still need to dictate exactly what I wanted to say, that it's no longer uh, a working app. Uh, I've been pretty aware that I've been spreading myself, you know, pretty thin for years now. And then this year, I, I just hit a wall of exhaustion, unlike anything I've ever hit before. And I realized if I didn't make changes, the quality of all this would degrade rapidly and my enjoyment would too, and it would just end. So letting go of the app, an app I love, was done to give me just one less thing to oversee, more time to focus on what the most people like, which is the weekly podcast content that drives everything else. The app is awesome. Bit Elixir did a fantastic job. Huge thank you to Chris and Zach, but they're just two guys. And we're a small staff, mostly focused on producing content. I realized it made a lot more sense to lean more on the Patreon app because it keeps getting better because they have a massive team of developers, millions of dollars to spend on it. They have a, a huge team of customer service reps for when you have problems. You know, it makes sense to lean on them rather than to try and do too many things ourselves. That's just been a big uh, thing I've learned the last couple of years. I used to dream of turning Bad Magic into this standalone network where we'd have this big app and host all these other shows. But I finally had to accept I'm never going to have time for that. And honestly, don't have the interest. I've learned a lot about myself these past seven years. I've learned that my passion is not in management. I don't want to work with a bunch of other creators. And deal with their frustrations and complaints when they're not, they're not getting the downloads they want or when the app has some kind of problem. I don't want to deal with backlash for what they say from my own fans. I don't want any of that fucking drama. It'll only take away from my ability to keep kicking out episodes that I feel good about every week. Some people love to collaborate and administrate. I prefer to work on this stuff solo uh, when I'm polishing it up and getting it ready to present. I'm not a big networker. I'm an introvert, actually. I love telling stories. I love hearing how they affect you. I think that is what I'm best at and want to spend more time doing what I am best at. Internally, I'll be handing over most uh, administrative duties I already have to Lindsay. She is a boss bitch. She's good at it. She loves taking charge. And while I'll still have, you know, final creative say, you know, this needs to be my voice. She's better at almost everything else. And that'll allow a weirdo like me just to uh, spend more time cracking myself up over weird shit that our researchers have found or uh, some stupid new bit or gag that I want to share with you. 
You know, I'm not trying to take over the podcast game and become the next all things comedy. I just want to try and keep you entertained to the point that you share this weird shit with enough other people that we get to keep doing what we're doing for hopefully a long time. Because when I'm not exhausted, holy shit is all of this so much fun. So much showbiz. Uh, in place of the app, we're launching a new website that Logan has been designing, badmagicproductions.com. That will link to landing sites for Time Sucks, Scared to Death, my stand at the merch store. Uh, it'll, it'll showcase what charities we've donated to, future projects, lots of stuff. You can listen to episodes from the site, watch YouTube videos, find contact info and more. Just like a one-stop shop for all things Bad Magic that'll be coming out in the next few weeks. Uh, also, with letting go of the app and streamlining things, our team here can spend more time creating clips for social media in order to keep getting the word out about what we do in a more competitive podcast landscape, which is important. We got to fucking fight like Harlan Sanders, or maybe not quite that hard, but almost to stay relevant, find new listeners, replace those who don't have time to listen anymore or have moved on for whatever reason. Maybe they're furious about my attack on inceldom. <laughs> and after hearing a lot of feedback from many of you about how your favorite episodes are the ones where I'm the most excited about the topic, you know, it just finally made sense to get rid of topic voting. After over five years of taking whatever space lizards gave me twice a month, uh, I think I now have a good idea of what topics I can do a good job with and what topics I struggle with. So thank you for that so much. You Space Lizards taught me so much. You've challenged me in the best of ways. Truly have shaped the style of Time Suck forever. I will always be grateful. And I will keep looking at your recommendations when you message us on Patreon or email us at bojangles at timesuckpodcast.com or you know, DM on the socials. I love hearing about something I would, have, uh, I would love to suck that I hadn't heard of. And finally with Patreon, huge thank you to the majority of you who chose to stick around after the end of The Secret Suck. That has meant the world. Uh, I'll start releasing random bonus content for you in 2024, by the way, in addition to your early release ad-free episodes. Uh, I have plans for some silly stuff. And, and I'm glad you're loving access to the entire Time Suck catalog ad-free, by the way, and the early releases. You know, because you do get that if your spaces are now, in addition to getting a 20% merch credit, you know, you get access to the entire back catalog of The Secret Suck, and you have 20% of your support going straight to charity. Uh, despite the ads we get, patronage is still very important to us because we carry a lot more overhead than other comparable, you know, sized podcasts that I know of. We got two full-time, do a little bit of everything, guys, in-house with Tyler C., Suck Ranger, and the summer camp party starter, and Logan Keith, the art warlock, the designer of almost everything we do here that is visual. We have two full-time researchers with Sophie Evans and Olivia Lee, and now working part-time with the new kick-ass researcher, Molly Jean Box. There is the Suck Dungeon lease, continual equipment maintenance, upgrading payroll taxes, insurance, on and on. We could kick out some content with a much smaller staff, but not as much, and it wouldn't feel the same. I could go back to recording episodes at home, but we'd lose a lot of the extra things that we just can't do without a staff, like camp, cool-looking video versions of the shows. I have to scale back on the amount of episodes I have planned for next year. The size of the sucks, the depths of the dives would change due to time constraints without research help, etc. So again, thank you. I hope I can make you want to stick around for the entirety of 2024 and I want to find some new space lizards as well. And last thing about our space lizards. Oh my God, the charity donations in 2024 between January and November, right? Before including the giving tree, Bad Magic donated, thanks to you, $156,244 to charities like Sustainable Alamance, Hill Country Humane Society, the DNA Doe Project and Big Table. And then for our giving tree, as I record this week before Christmas, Donations keep coming in. Too late to use some of them to buy for this year. So we're seeding a still unknown amount towards next year's Giving Tree already. Over $18,000 came in directly from listeners in addition to the Patreon donation and in addition to our matching donation. So rough numbers together. We all did over $190,000 in charitable work through Bad Magic, not counting putting almost $22,000 into the scholarship. So well over $200,000 overall. Speaking of scholarships, we never got around to congratulating our 2023 inaugural recipients. Ariana Lowe, Naomi Janarine, and Isabella Morales. Each of these bad magicians awarded $5,000. I hope it has helped your journey in higher education. Uh, so proud of you. Big thanks to St. Joan, Lindsay's mom, another person your patronage employs. She did such a great job working on this scholarship with uh, Lindsay. And the lifetime total of charitable contributions, including scholarship money, is now almost exactly $750,000. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Finally, to personalize how much the Giving Tree helps meet sacks, here's a post from Giving Tree recipient Jason Nyberg sent a heartfelt message expressing gratitude for the Bad Magic community. Jason wrote, Good morning. 
This message might seem kind of random and arbitrary, but I wanted to send it nonetheless, at least to express my gratitude. I have listened to both Scared to Death and Time Suck for about three to four years now. Y'all's humor and positivity has helped me get through a lot. My daughter and I were actually recipients of a Giving Tree present in 2020 when my family was dislocated and struggling due to Hurricane Laura. The reason for this message is just to say thank you. Thank you for continuing to do what you do, bringing joy to so many people and even solace in some cases. My daughter has since been diagnosed with nonverbal autism and I've also had to take on the mantle of single parent in the time since 2020. The work that y'all do has provided a mental haven for me and I can't express my gratitude enough. My daughter and I listen to the appropriate episodes and I sold the ones that are a little less appropriate for the little one. Please understand how much help and support you provided even though y'all don't see it on a daily basis. I will truly forever have y'all in my heart and will have eternal gratitude for what y'all do. All hail Lucifina and I hope everyone over Bad Magic has a wonderful day. Right? Jason's words reveal the genuine life-changing impact, right? That humor, positivity, community can have in people's lives. It's a heartwarming testament to the magic of giving and it encourages us all to continue spreading kindness and connection, even in the vast expanse of the often negative as fuck online world. Hail Nimrod and may the spirit of curiosity and compassion thrive within this community in 2024. Let's talk more about community now. Do you have any idea how many Cult of the Curious Facebook groups we have now? It is fucking insane. And these aren't ran by us, right? There's just a bunch of subgroups ran by other cool meat sacks. You can check out Cult of the, uh, of the subgroups to get a rough idea of what's out there. I'm hoping to do a better job uh, of doing a better job promoting all this in 2024. There's the Cook to the Curious, the Godhead, the Cult of the uh, Curious Commune, Cult of the Curious Book Club, Curious of the Cult, uh, Cult of the Curious Disc Golfers, Cult of the Curious Brain Trust, Cult of the Curious Mental Health, Cult of the Curious Dads Only, Nimrod's Logistics, Cult of the Curious Truckers, Chikatilo's Adventures, Lucifina Bound, Lucifina's Libations, Hail Lucifina, NSFW Social Club, Nimrod's Chicken Skin Duffel Bag, Bojangles Pets, Cult of the Curious Bojangles Brewers, Time Suck Metal Huds, Creeps and Peepers, which is, you know, the big scared to death one. Nimrod's Chariots, Nimrod's Forge, Nimrod's Tattoo Club, right? Cult of the Curious Musicians, Cult of the Technically Curious, Lucifina, The Fast and the Curious, uh, Curious Pagans, Witches, and Heathens, Cult of the Curious Plant Lovers, Meat Sack Marketplace, Nimrod Stock Talk, Cult of the Kink, Bikers for Nimrod, LGBTQIA+, plus, uh, excuse me, Cult of the Curious Safe Space for LGBTQIA+, plus. Time Suck, Cult, Pokemon Go, and, and that's not even fucking half of them. Hail Nimrod and holy shit. Plus, there's the amazing Time Suck Podcast Discord, Time Suck Subreddit, and in 2024, hoping to add a new community on Patreon that they've just developed as an alternative to a private Facebook group where we can foster even more community. Don't have details yet, but it's on my first quarter 24, uh, 2024 to-do list. You know, it might be a really cool place where hopefully we can open it up for like, I don't know, free trials or maybe keep that part free. I still got to figure it out. But I like that, you know, unlike Facebook, there's no bots monitoring it. And it's uh, truly like a free speech haven with no political leanings. Uh, yeah, just so many great people out there online helping each other out. We want to like keep it going. And let me share an example of how much these communities mean to people. One of Tyler's current duties, now that he's not spending hours each week with Secret Suck Curation, is to look for stories uh, just, you know, uh, like this next one for me to know about and sometimes share. And we have permission to share this one, by the way. Don't want you to think we're going to share your personal business without asking. Back on November 4th, 2021, Hector Ramirez joined the Cult of the Curious Dads Only group asking for advice about his daughter skipping school. Hector's heartfelt, heartfelt plea on the Cult of the Curious Dads Only Facebook group and frustration with his daughter's continuous school truancy struck a chord with many as he grappled with feeling powerlessness. And Hector posted, fuck, I need advice. My daughter won't stop skipping school. She's already grounded from everything and everyone. I have no ability to stop her from skipping classes and the school seems to not do anything to help even though they have truancy offers on site. I'm so angry and lost. In response, very quickly, a bunch of fellow fathers offered a range of advice. Adam McLaughlin emphasized understanding the root causes behind the truancy instead of punitive measures, writing, hey bro, you can't punish or scare this away. You need to find out why is she leaving? Does she hate school? Is she bullied? Is she getting high? Rebellion. Find the reason, then you have a shot at a solution. That's great. Other, other fathers in the group, like Robert Bailey, offered a more uh, controversial approach. Robert wrote, all right, sounds harsh, but you're going to have to punch her in the face. Sorry, there's no other way. <laughs> Obviously joking. A little, little humor to lighten it up. I like that too. Brady Kaylee Smith posted a bold tactic to expose the potential consequences of truancy, saying, 
Drive her ass to a gathering of homeless people and show her what will happen firsthand if she isn't conscientious about her future at least a little bit. After that, her future is in her own hands. Either way, she will do what she wants to do, but it's your job to at least educate her decision-making the best you can. Do it with love, not with anger. Tell her this is where you're so tell her this is what you're so concerned about, her life becoming this, as you point to homelessness conditions. Jason McKenzie emphasized creating a safe space for open dialogue, writing, establish a conversation where anything she tells you will not get her in trouble. And the hard part is actually following through and find out what is going on so you can help her to better life choices. Probably won't happen at once. Now, what was the outcome of all this with Hector's daughter? I don't know. We don't know. We don't need to. It's not important to the point, you know, I'm making here. The point is Hector asked for advice. Other community members stepped up immediately, did their best to give him that. This shit happens every day, literally in these groups. So cool to see a bunch of different meat sacks who oftentimes have never met in real life do what they can to help each other. Another meat sack who I won't name uh, because we don't have permission to use their name recently was going through it. Things had gotten so tough. They needed help with their utility bill. And they posted in the cult of the curious three out of five stars about how they had never made a post like this before in their life, but didn't know where else to turn. How they were worried about losing heat, how that would affect their kids. They'd heard about the cult, rallying to help people in dire situations before. They were very humble, timid about the whole thing. Mostly just were asking where they should try to get help. Can you point me in the right direction? And they left their Venmo information. Less than 10 minutes later, six to be exact, they had more than they needed. They thanked the cult, explained that the extra money was going towards making sure their kids were getting what they wanted for the holidays. Hail Nimrod. This shit happens all the time in this community, and I'm very aware of how special and unique that is. So excited to try and do more, lean on staff more to highlight these stories. And I won't be doing that out of vanity, right? These stories aren't about me. They're about you. I just want to share more of them because I know that stories like that will resonate with more good, helpful folks and, you know, more people who need help the more I can encourage and help inspire these people to get into our community by sharing these stories to create more positive change, the more no change will come. Uh, Thinking again about how my time truly is limited and how I should protect it and use it to the best of my ability, I think of an analogy of having a garden and a limited amount of water to use on it. I only have so much in my bucket each day. If I try and water too many plants, they'll all die. If I pour all the water on only one plant, well, then obviously only one lives. So I've thought about how many plants can I not only keep alive, but have them thrive. And in 2024, outside of weekly podcast content, I want to pour more water on our community through highlighting cool shit going on in order to help it grow and thrive and keep these stories coming. Also in 2024, in just a few weeks, going to be giving you uh, more content every month. Twice a month is the goal. We'll see how it goes. Taking a lot of, uh, you know, uh, travel and creative heavy lifting off my plate, you know, letting go of uh, stand-up for a while, letting go of weekly Secret Suck recordings and prep. I'm going to try and replace some of this with two mini sucks each month. Just little, maybe 45 minutes to an hour long episodes that I currently think will drop on Friday. Some Fridays, not every Friday. No segments, no updates, no announcements. A little bit looser conversational style. I'll share stories that might be reminiscent of the type of topics, you know, we've already covered or maybe not. Stuff that may not have enough meat on them for a three-hour episode, but plenty for 45 minutes or 60 minutes. And I want to add to the variety of the overall catalog, work on improving my storytelling skills in a different way, not fuck with the style of the Monday episodes, but also shake things up to keep the creative juices flowing. And I don't have any info, uh, you know, other than that to share with you about this at this moment, but you'll, you'll see something pop up in your feeds here in just a few weeks. And I hope you enjoy it. Uh, you know, if you don't, well, I guess, uh, you know, I'll, I'll reduce their frequency or, get, or replace it with something else. If you, if you do enjoy it, you know, I'll kick them out as uh, often as I feel inspired. Hopefully twice a month, but we'll see. And then I'm, gonna, I'm planning on doing something similar on Scared to Death. See how that feels as well. And if it all feels good and then manageable and fun, maybe I will finally release a new show, a fictional series I've jotted down notes about for years now. Just a little seasonal show akin to a beefed up audio book. Who knows, you know, short episodes, but serialized. All depends on how much, you know, creative water I feel like I have to spread around on all these fun little podcast plants. And it depends, obviously, on how many of you keep listening and keep spreading all of this to others. Okay, I finally feel like I should wrap up now. I could talk forever about all this. Thank you, thank you for a great year. Thank you for supporting me, allowing me to take a year off the road, for giving me the opportunity to feel so excited about next year. Despite running out of gas, it was actually a relatively drama-free year. And I mostly just feel grateful for it, right? Sure, there were a few bumps along the way. There always are. 
you know, a contingent of fans getting mad about this or that. Former employees bitching about this or that as well. But after doing this a little while now, I realized that's inevitable. It's just life. And it's nothing I even feel is worth digging into the specifics about. I've learned that spending too much time talking about certain forms of negativity, it just breeds more drama and negativity. So I'm gonna stay positive. And I do feel positive. I'm excited to get to keep doing what I love, keep trying to entertain a fan base that I truly believe is good or, or a better group of kind, funny, rough around the edges in the best of ways, diverse, amazing, empathetic, thoughtful group of people than any other fan base. This is the fucking best cult. And I'm so grateful to be your reluctant, weird, nonprofit, not actually trying to ride your bicycles leader. Also excited to sleep in my own bed a bunch this next year. Spend a ton of time with Kyler when he's home from college. Go to a bunch of Monroe's basketball games. Go on dates with my best friend, amazing business partner, and beautiful wife, Lindsay. Throw the ball around more in the yard for Penny Pooper and, and Ginger Bell. Work out on a regular basis with my friends at the gym. Uh, to stop canceling doctor's appointments. Finally figure out what the fuck is going off my truck. So many warning lights come on every time I start it now. Uh, to, you know, to pour in some water into friendships I've spent too much time ignoring or taking for granted. To catching up on watching friends specials. Amazing TV shows I've missed. Seeing my grandma more. All kinds of stuff. I'm looking forward to managing my life a bit better, carving out more space to enjoy this amazing ride as it happens. Otherwise, what's the fucking point? If you're lucky enough to be able to provide for your children, to set yourself up for retirement, to have a fulfilling career and great family and friends, what is the next thing you should probably focus on if you're not already focusing on it? Enjoying your life. Good or bad, it's not going to last very long. So don't take it for granted. I mean, hopefully you can enjoy it while you handle your responsibilities. Hopefully you can find little moments of light, even when it seems, you know, dark and dreary. But if you can't even enjoy it, you know, when it's going really well, a space I've spent too much time in, well, then maybe it's time to slow down, reevaluate. Nimrod only gives us one set of spins around the sun for sure. Don't let them pass them, pass you by. You magnificent, beautiful bastards. Let's get to the takeaways now. And then just for this week, for this atypical episode, there will be no time sucker updates. This whole second half already felt like a massive update. I'll return to those next year as in next week. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Harlan Sanders, the KFC colonel, shot a man named Matt Stewart in a gas station turf war during the Great Depression in North Corbin, Kentucky. The colonel did not fucking play when it came to business. Number two, one of the Har Harlan's last acts as a lawyer, if not his very last act, was to beat up one of his own clients in court in front of a judge in Little Rock, Arkansas. Number three, what a year, Sonny Hollister showed up I flexed my Italian fluency. We learned a lot about women's bicycles. Spent a lot of time talking about generic action figures. Deep dive everything from a history of witchcraft to the life and crimes of R. Kelly to how Jim Bob Duggar maybe doesn't have the best, most wholesome beliefs to John Bon Jovi's Korean War songs and more. And number four, oh, how about this one more time? Yeah, give it away. Yeah, give it away. My neighbor got big testicles because we see this dude every day. Every day. We eat ribs with this dude. And we didn't have a clue The girl was in that house She said, please help me get out Dead giveaway Number five, new info Harlan Sanders very protective When it came to guarding his secret Original Kentucky Fried Blend of 11 herbs and spices No one ever leaked the recipe when he was alive Probably afraid he'd punch him out or shoot him But in 2016, a reporter was shown A handwritten recipe from a family scrapbook If you want to try and make some KFC at home Here's that recipe Two-third teaspoon salt one half teaspoon thyme, one half teaspoon basil, one third teaspoon oregano, one teaspoon celery salt, one teaspoon black pepper, one teaspoon dried mustard, four teaspoons paprika, two teaspoons garlic salt, one teaspoon ground ginger, three teaspoons white pepper. All those spices get mixed with two cups of flour to create the iconic KFC breading. Then you dip, dip each piece of chicken in water for seven seconds. Dry it for seven seconds. Roll it in the mixture seven times before shaking out the excess flour and frying it in a pressure fryer. Clearly, Harlan liked the number seven. KFC has denied that this recipe is authentic, but if it was authentic, were they actually going to admit that? I don't think so. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Thank you for listening to the final Bad Magic production podcast of 2023. Scared to death, time suck each week. Please don't get into a gas station shootout this week. Maybe talk to a lawyer if someone's fucking with your sign instead. Just keep frying your chicken and keep on sucking. Bad 
Sound Magic Productions. No goofy little post-show ending silliness this week. Just more gratitude. Uh, yeah, thank you truly for a great year. You giga Chad and giga Stacy, big dick, big lady Wayne motherfuckers. I hope you have an incredible 2024 coming your way. I hope you fight like Harlan Sanders, whatever it is you're hoping for. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina. Be sure to pet whoever your Bojangles is if you have them and keep kicking out the good time jams. Triple N. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>